I'm going to call this meeting to order for the City of Iowa City Council meeting on September 21st, 2021. It is just past 6 p.m. And we're going to start with roll call, please. Fergus? Here. Mims? Here. Sully? Here. Taylor? Here. Teague? Here. Thomas? Here. Weiner? Here. Well, welcome back again, counselors, and welcome to the public that's here in present in, in, in person tonight. Welcome you all to the Senior Center, which is our temporary home during COVID, so we can spread out. Um, I also want to remind the counselors to pull your mic close when we speak, and you may have to remind me throughout this uh, time together. First item on the agenda is uh, proclamations is item number two, and I'm going to go with 2A which is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Whereas domestic violence, data and violence and stalking affects women, children and men of all races, of all racial, cultural and economic backgrounds, causing long-term physical, psychological and emotional harm. And whereas one in three Americans have witnessed an incident of domestic violence. And whereas children who experience domestic violence are at a higher risk for failure in school, mental illness, substance abuse, suicide, and may choose violence as a way to solve problems later in life. And whereas dom domestic violence in rural communities exists as a hidden, silent, and often unrecognized crime that is often underreported. And whereas throughout the inspiration, courage, and persistence of victims of domestic violence, their children and advocates, our communities are learning to recognize the impact of violence and the home and intimate relationships. And whereas through the, and whereas the domestic violence intervention program has worked to end violence and intimate relationships for more than 40 years through the collaborative partnerships of advocates, volunteers, local municipalities, criminal justice, health and human services, faith communities, business leaders and private citizens, whereas our community achievements should be commended and we must continue our commitment to respect and support victims of domestic violence and to prevent future violence in our community. Now, therefore, I, Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2021 to be Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Iowa City, Iowa, and urge all citizens to work together to eliminate <coughs> domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking from our community. Here to re accept this is Alta Peters. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much. It's Alta Medea <laughs> Peters. Um, thank you again so much to uh, the city of Iowa City for all of your ongoing support <laughs> of uh, the work that we do. I do have, um, it's kind of hard to see. I did hand these out to you all as well, but a few different um, numbers that I like to report when I come to visit you all. And uh, we are quite proud of the fact that 96% of the individuals we've helped over the past year have reported feeling safer because of the work that our advocates do. So that is something to be proud of. And, and certainly the work that they do could not be done without the support of the city of Iowa City. A couple other numbers uh, that I'd like to draw the council's attention to um, is the number of individuals served. Within Johnson County in the past year, despite the, the pandemic sort of forcing people to isolate at home and being unable to reach out in usual ways, our numbers still remained high. We served 1,519 individuals in Johnson County alone. Of those numbers, 1,145 of them were from the Iowa City community. That is nearly double what it was the previous year. And that is something for us to really consider as we move forward in the coming years addressing the pandemic and how we support victim survivors um, that are our neighbors and friends and colleagues. The number one way that victims find out about our services is through word of mouth. So we encourage everyone on the council as well as listening tonight to reach out to us to uh, provide us with spaces to do prevention education and community outreach. Some of those um, activities will be going on in October during Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, and uh, it's, it's not listed because we just got the date ironed out yesterday, but our 15th annual Shop for Shelter, which you may 
uh, have recognized some of our volunteers handing out shopping lists at local area grocery stores will be occurring on October 23rd this year from 9.30 to 1.30. So just a half day to provide some in-kind resources to those most vulnerable. The goods that we receive at that event provide resources for up to nine months for those that reside in our emergency shelter and use our mobile advocacy. So that was a, a date I wanted to point out that wasn't on the original handout. I would love to take any questions or address any thoughts or concerns y'all might have. I know this council really do appreciate all of the work you all do. I have a proclamation that I want to hand to you, so I'll be right over. Let's give a hand for all the work that they do. And very appreciative for all the work that you do in this community. And we are on to item number 2D, which is Fire Prevention Week. Whereas the city of Iowa City is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and around visiting Iowa City. And whereas fire is a serious public safety concern, both locally and nationally, and homes are the locations where people are at greatest risk from fire, and whereas home fires killed 2,980 people in the United States in 2019. According to the National Fire Protection Association and fire departments in the United States responded to 481,500 homes. And whereas working smoke alarms cut the risk of dying in reported home fires in half, and three out of five home fire deaths results from fires and properties without work and smoke alarms. And whereas half of home fires deaths result from fires reported at night between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. when most people are asleep. And whereas Iowa City respond, first responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection education. And whereas Iowa City residents are responsive to public education measures and are able to take personal steps to increase their safety from fire, especially in their homes. And whereas the 2021 Fire Prevention Week theme, learn the sounds of fire safety, effectively remind us to look for places fire could start. Listen for the sound of the smoke alarm and learn two ways out of every room. Now, therefore, I, Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim October 3rd through the 9th, 2021, as Fire Prevention Week throughout the city and urge everyone to install smoke alarms and to support the many public safety activities and efforts during Fire Prevention Week 2021 and year-round. And welcome, Fire Marshal Gear. Thank you, Mayor Teague, and thank you, Council, for what you do. Um, well, a little bit of history on Fire Prevention Week. It's observed every year during the week of October 9th in commemoration of the Great Chicago Fire, which began on October 8th, 1871. It didn't get put out till the 10th. And it caused a lot of damage. The horrific conf conflagration killed more than 250 people, left 100,000 homeless, destroyed more than 17,400 structures, and burned more than 2,000 acres of land. So in 1925, President Coolidge proclaimed Fire Prevention Week a national observance, making it the longest running public health observance in our country. During Fire Prevention Week, children, adults, and teachers learn how to stay safe in case of a fire. Firefighters provide life-saving public education in an effort to drastically decrease casualties caused by fires. In a fire, mere, mere seconds can mean the difference between a safe escape and a tragedy. Fire safety education isn't just for school children. Teenagers, adults, and the elderly are all also at risk in fires, making it important for every member of the community to take some time in every, November, or every October during Fire Prevention Week to make sure that they understand how to stay safe in a fire. 
this year's fire, fire prevention week campaign, learn the sounds of fire safety, works to educate everyone about the different sounds the smoke and carbon monoxide alarms make. And they are two different distinct tones. If you have a, a beep that goes three times, that's your fire alarm. If it beeps four times, that would be your carbon monoxide. And that's some of the stuff that we learned through this, through this uh, fire prevention week. And you know, when an alarm makes noise, a beeping sound or a chirping sound, you must take action. And you know, we want you to practice fire safety all year round, not just for this week. We want to make sure everybody's safe. But you know, we're looking, we're talking a little bit about learning the sounds of fire safety. There's people out there that have had that have hearing disabilities <coughs> or are deaf. So there are some some smoke alarms and alert devices that that you can use for people that that have these um, that that have hard of hearing issues. You know, they're they they have some that are have strobes, which allow them to visually know that there's a fire alarm, or even a bed shaker for at night. So with that, we just you know, we're, the, the pandemic has kept us from doing a few things with uh, our Fire Prevention Week activities, but there'll be some neat stuff coming out. We had um, communications and Jack and, and Ty, they filmed some stuff today that we're gonna send to the schools, we're gonna send out to the community. So even though we're gonna miss, miss out a lot of face-to-face, -face, we're gonna get some stuff there for you. And hopefully everybody stays safe from fire. And thank you again. Thank you, Fire Marshal Greer, and we're so happy that even during COVID, there is a way to still engage. Thank you again. We can give them a hand. Thank you so much. We are on to item number three, which is a pre, uh, presentation by um, a COVID update with Johnson County Public Health. And we're gonna invite Sam Jarvis, who is the Community Health Division Manager. Welcome. Good evening to the council. And as always, oh, as always, uh, appreciate the opportunity to provide updates uh, on a regular basis to our community. Uh, I believe the last time that we provided updates, we were looking at, I, I believe, 30 to 40 some cases a day and since then, and, and since um, really the end of July, we have seen a stair-step increase in our cases. Uh, at the moment right now, we're looking at roughly anywhere from 50 to 60 a day. You know, the past seven days, we've seen about 565 cases. Uh, and some interesting things to note about that is that a good majority of those are, are you know, two-thirds are, are 22 and older. So we are still seeing some uh, adults, uh, you know, certainly not in the, the school system or college age. Uh, test positive and uh, you know again uh, we cannot emphasize how important it is to get vaccinated to to all of our community and we continue our effort for communication and providing opportunities you know supply is no longer an issue it's widely available uh, and so we we continue to try to be thoughtful in our methods of outreach and trying to meet those who are in the movable middle or what we refer to as a movable middle who might need just a little bit more encouragement or information to make that choice uh, recognizing there are some that we probably will not be able to reach and certainly uh, will choose not to get vaccinated, unfortunately. But, um, you know, other other notes with our, our case kind of profile, uh, we continue to see it spread in unvaccinated households. Uh, so as once we reported before, where at times persons would be able to successfully isolate in their own home, uh, at this point in time, uh, knowing that the Delta variant is so contagious, we are seeing it spread pretty quickly. Uh, and unvaccinated clusters. So that also in includes our schools and daycare. So uh, we've been, uh, you know, paying close attention to those and working with our, our community partners and those work groups that we have established uh, and touch points uh, to continue to provide support uh, and then really um, strategize different ways that you, know, you can continue to provide mitigation measures in those situations. So. I think the one thing that's on everyone's mind right now, uh, certainly our federal administration in early September had noted that September 20th, we would hear more about boosters for the general population. And really, we've done a lot of information and, and trying to keep everyone informed that that was really a planning date set by the, um, the Biden administration and that just last week, last Friday actually, uh, the subcommittee at the CDC had just only reviewed the, the data for, for boosters. So 
Uh, we know that there's at least one more meeting this week uh, for the committee for the uh, Advisory Committee of Immunization Practices, or what we refer to as the ACIP. Uh, they're meeting over Wednesday and Thursday. So we do hope to, to know a little bit more about what the strategy will be going forward. So, you know, many folks are probably have that date on their calendar and wondering what that will be. And, and certainly uh, recognize the confusion that it's caused with the, the different dates and and uh, um, different cutoff points for everything, whether it's with Pfizer, Moderna, or, or Johnson & Johnson. So uh, we want to be intentional and very thoughtful about our communication going forward. So we are awaiting that information and, and please know that uh, we plan on doing a lot more communication about those those efforts because we know that's on a lot of folks' minds uh, every day. And, you know, I think weekly we've seen new updates from Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson about releasing their data or, excuse me, sending their data to the, the federal government to review for five to 11 year olds and things. So uh, it's on all of our minds uh, and please know that we're, we're watching that closely so that we can uh, inform the community. In terms of other vaccine updates, we continue to be uh, the county that has the highest rate. Uh, the state's recent update on their dashboard does break down in different age ranges from either our total population <coughs> 12 and older, 18 year old and older, and 65 and older. And each of those categories, we continue to have high rates. Uh, so we're happy to see that. Uh, we appreciate our community recognizing the importance of vaccination, but as always, we try to uh, increase that rate as much as possible. So uh, I believe those are really the, the high points that we wanted to share. Uh, happy to answer any questions uh, about vaccines, cases, hospitalizations, or other trends that we're seeing locally. <coughs> So I know that the you mentioned that the average right now is in the 50s. I, when I looked at it on Friday, I believe it was 57 um, was the average of those that are testing positive for COVID. One of the questions I have is with the vaccinated individuals, sometimes they may not feel the symptoms <coughs> as well as, you know, it's self-reporting in a way within the schools. Are you in, is there any thoughts that we might be under-reported either small amount that statistically don't make a difference or or it, we're significantly underreported? Uh, that's a great question. I, I would imagine that many of us would think that we're, we're underreporting. Uh, I think there's just uh, enough fatigue uh, where, where persons are, are thinking their mild symptoms or their allergies and, and not getting tested. Uh, so that's very likely the situation. But uh, again, we do want everyone to know that testing is available and free to every Iowan uh, through Test Iowa. Uh, ourselves at the health department, we are a pickup site for test kits. Uh, they're certainly available at other locations as well, but um, that, is, is, that is like the case. Um, so again, a, a part of our messaging, uh, even the slightest symptoms, please consider, uh, you know, depending on your exposure status or, or certainly your high-risk activities, those are other things to consider too. Um, I could also imagine a lot of folks are just, if, if, if it's mild symptoms, they, they may, it may not cross their mind. Uh, you know, after 19 months, so especially if they are vaccinated. Thank you. What is um, what is your view about rapid testing? Should um, is there are uh, countries and there are even some states where rapid testing is um, sent to homes and it's it's available to schools. It's available free. I mean, is, my personal sense is basically we can't test enough. Uh, absolutely. You know, I, I wish we had a better testing framework like that here in the in the state and in the, in the nation. But uh, I know that uh, the the more recent kind of trend or, or phrase or mantra with testing is test to stay. And that does involve rapid testing, which uh, is not as widely available as we'd like. Uh, I think the, the case example is what's going on in Massachusetts. They've done a, a really wonderful job. And I know that they've been highlighted kind of for their testing strategy at the moment, uh, utilizing the, the rapid buy next now cards. Uh, and everything and uh, you know unfortunately the, the they're not as available here uh, those are cards that are provided to our long-term care facilities and they've utilized those um, for a lot of surveillance testing as well uh, but um, again test Iowa um, has a, the PCR saliva kits and we're definitely encouraging folks to to order those and have those available for themselves I also just wanted to ask have you seen um, any uptick after the after a couple of very crowded football games 
Uh, you know, it's not as dramatic as what we were concerned about. But again, as always, we've seen a, a small stair step increase. The other thing to, to think of or, or to know is, again, we've got a pretty high vaccination rate in our community. So that's also probably providing some, some protective factor, which would make sense. We certainly would like to see, again, we'd like to see our vaccinate rate, vaccination rate higher. But, um, you know, uh, again, uh, the events can occur, but we don't know the burden of disease or transmission unless people test, so. Mm -hmm. Sam, I think last time you were here, you were able to keep up on contact tracing and investigations. What's the status of that now? Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, it has been uh, increasingly difficult with this case burden. Uh, I know that we had sent out uh, notice to our committee partners and the school districts primarily that uh, at the moment we've paused uh, contact tracing in junior high and, and high school. Primarily one, the, the time it takes to um, contact trace within school and classrooms with our, our school nurse partners. And then certainly the time lag adds up uh, to get the information from our partners for us to make uh, contact uh, with those folks. Uh, I can kind of put it in a better perspective uh, if contact tracing is still kind of a, an abstract thought, but have you ever played phone tag with a single person during their work day? Uh, please try to imagine that uh, 50 or 100 fold, uh, you know, throughout the, the week and everything. So uh, the time does add up and the time spent on one case certainly takes and detracts from other cases. So. Uh, it was a hard choice to make, and I know that the team was, uh, you know, concerned and, and disappointed that we've had to re-strategize, but we know that primarily most of that age range is able to get vaccinated, and that's certainly the, the note that we left with our partners, that that is, uh, first and foremost, the best layer of mitigation. Uh, we continue to do contact tracing in uh, the elementary schools, though, but uh, it is getting difficult, uh, certainly the fatigue. Uh, person's not wanting to pick up or, or uh, walk through the process of the disease investigation uh, adds up as well, too. So, Thank you so much. All right. As always, appreciate the time of the council. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you All right. We are on to our consent calendar, which is items four through nine. Can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar, removing item 7G for separate consideration? So move, Sade. Second, Thomas. All right. Would anyone from the public like to address anything that is on our consent calendar that is not on any other um, specific item on our agenda? <laughs> Seeing, that's later on the agenda. Yep. 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 And I'll I'll invite people up when at that time. This, this is, yep, no, this is um, the consent agenda, which have items under the consent agenda. So if you want to speak about any item under the consent agenda, now is the time for the public to speak. Great questions. <laughs> Hearing, seeing no one from the public, council discussion. I had just a, a quick uh, minor editorial comment, um, Kelly, and um, under two or four B, the formal summary of minutes, and two D under that uh, was the National Senior Center uh, Award, and it listed Angela McConville. Um, she did accept, but it said it just says Senior Center uh, Commission. Uh, our senior center chair, and it should uh, be edited to see, say, senior center commission chair. You understand that? Okay. I do. Thanks. Sorry about that. Great. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Sully? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Can I get a motion to defer item 7G to October 5th? So moved, Mims. Second, Weiner. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed to seven to zero. Item number 10, this is an opportunity, uh, this is community comment, and this is an opportunity from any for anyone in the community to come up and have, uh, to speak on any, item that is not on our agenda. There is a sign-in sheet on the side table, and we ask that people 
sign in, and we also ask that you keep your uh, comments three minutes to three minutes. We do have a timer over here that will do that, and we'll I'll open up community comment um, until 7 p.m. unless we end early. Yes, and I also want to specify this is the like the TRC item is on the agenda, and that'll be up later. Welcome. Please give us your first, uh, please give us your name and your address. I'm Judy Fole, 2229 Abbey Lane, and I came to introduce myself. Apparently I should have done this two years ago. Uh, you, I've been appointed, or you've appointed me to be on the airport commission. And one of the things they said is be sure that the council knows who the airport commissioners are. So just wanted to say hello. Uh, I've been in Iowa City since I got married in 1974. I've lived in student housing. I've lived on the over near Sycamore Mall. I currently am at Tynakai neighborhood. Actually, I'm the president, uh, which is off of Mormon Trek. I'm very familiar with the airport, uh, with all of what flies over us all the time. My house is close to it. Uh, I'm not a pilot. I do not fly. But at the time, uh, it was suggested there somebody from the neighborhood might be, or from one of the neighborhood organizations would be good to have them involved in the airport commission. And so I've been on it, and this year I'm the secretary of it. So I just wanted to thank you for uh, appointing me. I'm enjoying it, I'm learning a lot, and be sure and check the airport website. We have a really good website we've created that gives the history, that tells a lot about the effect of how the airport is good economically for the city, and um, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful spot if you get a chance to look at the website. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Give us your name and your address, please. Tracy John Sargent, 3341 Tulane Ave. Kelly, if you would be kind enough to... It's actually on the laptop there. Okay, upper, perfect. Upper left. Yes, it is. So as I've previously stated, my name is Tracy John Sargent. I am the uh, founder and executive director of the Multicultural Development Center of Iowa, which is a nonprofit organization that focuses on economic development and uh, diversity in STEM. I'm also the co-founder of a newly founded collective called ReConnect, which stands for Racial Equity Connect. And I'd like to talk to you today about the collective, uh, who we are, and why we decided we needed to form this uh, group. So uh, the collective is a group of black, Latinx, indigenous, immigrant, Asian, uh, and people of color led nonprofit organizations and businesses that are all committed to facilitating economic development that's truly inclusive and representative. With racial equity as our guiding star, we aim to cultivate community connectedness, access, and prosperity for and with socioeconomically vulnerable and underserved Johnson County residents. We're qualified professionals, leaders, and organizations with areas of expertise that are broad but interconnected. They include business development, STEM education, strategic planning, mentorship, food security, civil rights, poverty reduction, community organizing, immigrant and refugee support, youth and family services, and more. We took a page out of the uh, SBA playbook and have adopted a hub and spoke model I apologize, that's really small, so I will help you uh, understand the various logos that are represented. Uh, at the center uh, is my uh, organization logo, MDC Iowa, because it's just too long to say Multicultural Development Center of Iowa over and over again. Uh, and then Astig Planning, uh, which is my uh, one of our co-founders, and we are co-hub. Uh, we then have Coralville Community Food Pantry, Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit, Iowa City Bike Library, LULAC, uh, Chapter 308, Dream City, uh, Banjo Knits Empowerment, uh, and we have additional uh, groups that will be joining uh, and are going through their internal approval process right now. Um, we chose the hub and spoke model because we believe it creates an opportunity for us to come together and to truly collaborate. Most of us are small organizations that you might not define as legacy nonprofits or legacy organizations, but we feel we're closest to the problem and most qualified to address and make the change needed. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. 
Hi there, I'm Angie Jordan. I'm at 1125 Apple Court, and I am a spoke on this hub and spoke wheel with my uh, for-profit Banjo Knits Empowerment, which is entrepreneurial support and community development. And I'm excited to be part of this team and a member of this uh, collective. Tracy was saying the closest those closest to the problem are those closest to the solution. So I'm gonna stay on task here because I have that time thing, and y'all who know me know I can go all over the place, but the term racial equity has entered into the mainstream consciousness and vernacular. Organizations are scrambling to adopt that DEI, which has already become an acronym. For those of you who don't know what DEI is, it's diversity, equity, and inclusion. Folks are scrambling, organizations are scrambling for these initiatives, but many are not having the impact needed for the real sustainable change. For too long, our voices and perspectives have been missing. They've maybe been missing for lots of different reasons being dismissed, being tokenized, and even you know, being co-opted by some of those folks in power as their own uh, ideas or thoughts. Though we have had a front seat to inequities that exist in our community, we are rarely offered a seat at the decision-making table. And I, I do wanna just put in there, we're offered sometimes a way to be a volunteer or to sit on a board, but not in an authentic, safe way that's receptive representative of us and of how we want to be on, on our own terms. So we believe we cannot achieve racial equity by doing business as usual, allowing those who have traditionally held positions of power to dictate the roadmap for change. As experts and leaders in this work, it's time for this collective to be front and center in the pursuit for more equitable, inclusive, oh my goodness, I'm having trouble with that word, before our local economy. <laughs> So one minute, wow, I thought I, I'm gonna slow down my talking because usually this, this is, I just wanna take a moment. There are so many benefits as to why this collective um, should come to be and be supported. These are just a few of them. There's access to trusted advisors within connections that have these connections already established in the community. Our collective members are culturally knowledgeable and already doing the work. We're already doing it, some of us for free. Um, we don't have to recreate the wheel in this collective. This collective would have the ability to actually, and I'm just gonna underline that, actually bridge the gap in underserved communities. We'd be able to target an outreach to socially and economically disadvantaged individuals and it would be an efficient and an effective use of public funds with a reduction in duplications of services. And with 10 seconds left, I wanna also say that established organizations that are in those power and privileged spaces are also wanting to be nodes and partners with us already. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is V Fixman Arise, and I am at 437 South Governor Street and I am part of this collective. I'm just gonna advance Angie's slides. Um, yeah, so my pronouns are they, she, and she, uh, and um, I am the co-founder, I'm the CEO and founder of Astig Planning, a local uh, community and environmental planning firm, and I'm also co-founder of the collective. So before I get into the, the ask or what we need from you, I just wanna say that I think this collective really does align with the seven, within the seven priorities of um, the city, especially uh, when considering advancing social justice, racial equity, and human rights. So with that, what we really need from you is public support for what we're trying to do. Um, obviously, financial resources are something that um, you know, everybody's been talking about and certainly we have represented here. I did want to highlight um, and promote the city staff's own presentation in terms of BIPOC business support infrastructure and the estimates there um, for some of the things that we've been talking about, uh, physical space, you know, accelerator programs, startup and expansion grants. Um, so this collective um, kind of has these elements already uh, integrated into the things that we do, the programs that we have, and the capital improvements that we would like to seek. So we have an estimated collective budget of four million, which uh, aligns with what city staff have also outlined, um, as you can see, al al aligned with that above it. Um, so that also um, is not only just about the American Recovery um, Plan Act, it's, it's other funds that are available as well um, that we would like to be a part of. Um, 
and really also to commit to rethinking public-private partnerships. You know, this, this SBA model certainly is advantageous because you can support mul multiple organizations and businesses um, through one single avenue. Um, but, you know, what does it mean to have that public-private pri partnership? How can it work both ways? And um, a willingness to guide and advise our collective. So we already have um, some, some uh, insights from the county. Um, Keisha Fields has been joining us and, you know, helping us with our pathway uh, to, you know, where we're trying to go. And so it's been very effective to have somebody there. And so we really seek that from all of you and, and city staff um, to make this truly a partnership. So what are the next steps? Um, so obviously identifying the public funds, which I've already outlined a little bit, uh, but there's obviously uh, current programs that we already offer that we would just like to make sure that are aligned with what the city wants to do. There's already synergy there. We've worked with many of you and we'd like to see more of that happen. And then more formally, we would like the opportunity to present a proposal um, for our ask um, to city council for discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Say by the bell. <laughs> Welcome. Hello, Mr. Mayor and City Council people. My name is Jay Harold Hanian the third. I'm not my father, so I'm not coming down representing my dad. I'm representing me. I live at 420 North First Avenue, apartment number 204, and I work at the University of Iowa, and I'm coming down here to talk to you guys about I understand you changed the bus schedule um, several about a month ago and um, the bus director told me that the reason why you changed it is because um, they changed it is because they wanted more frequent bus service which I get that and the bus service is very nice here in Johnson County in Iowa City but what you've done by changing it, um, the University of Iowa is one of your biggest employees in Iowa City, and you changed three routes on the east side of Iowa City, and by changing the hours that the bus goes by in the morning, you're not enabling the people that um, would take the bus um, to work, you're not enabling them to get to work on time at 7 a.m. in the morning, and thus, um, they can't take the bus and you're putting more cars on the road and I would like um, you guys to consider changing some of the routes again so that you could enable the workers to take the bus and get to work on time by 7 o'clock in the morning um, thank you for your time thank you would anyone else like to address uh, council at this time for any item that is not on our agenda so the TRC will be up soon yes yep 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 we have some newbies in here so we welcome you all <laughs> seeing no one we're going to move on to item number 11 this is planning and zoning matters we're on to 11a zoning code amendment self-service storage units uses and community commercial zones ordinance this is the ordinance amending title 14 zoning code to allow self-service storage uses by special exemption in cc2 zoning districts this is special consideration and the applicant is requesting expedited action I move that the rule requiring the ordinances must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended, that the second consideration and vote be waived, and that the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. Second. Moved by ma'am, seconded by Taylor. And we're going to ask for our staff to give us a presentation at this time. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. I do not have a presentation at this time since this is second reading. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Any questions? from council at all great would anyone from the public like to address this topic please come to the podium at this time seeing no one council discussion roll call please Thomas yes Weiner yes Burgess yes Mims yes Salee yes Taylor yes 
Teague. Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Could I get a motion to pass and adopt? So moved. Second. Moved by Mims, seconded by Salee. Roll call, please. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Could I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved. Second, Mims. Moved by Weiner, seconded by Mims. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes seven to zero. On to item number 11B is fringe area rezoning, 510 American Legion Road Southeast. This is a letter to the Johnson County Planning and Zoning Commission in support of a rezoning from county agricultural to county residential for approximately 5.37 acres of property located in unincorporated Johnson County at 510-5110 American Legion Road Southeast. Can I get a motion, please? Move. Approval. Move for approval. Move by Salee. Second. Second. Seconded by Weiner. And welcome. We'll have staff comments. Thank you, Mayor. Danielle Sitzman, Neighborhood and Development Services. Sorry for jumping the gun there on the agenda item earlier. Even the experienced folks here can occasionally get things wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an application from Axiom Consultants applying on behalf of Chris Lehman, requesting the rezoning as described in the title for approximately five acres. Um, if this is rezoning is approved, the applicant intends to divide the land into approximately three single family residential lots. Um, the area in question here is shown in the white dotted outline. The existing land use is currently a county zoning for agriculture. The requested rezoning would be a, to a county zoning that does allow residential. Uh, currently, it contains the land contains one single family home, um, is covered with grass and trees. It does not have a flood hazard nor any steeper wooded terrain on it. Um, again, this is showing the location of the property on the right hand side of the screen, uh, circled there. Um, the property, property is subject to our fringe area agree, agreement in uh, area B. It's outside of the city's growth area. As you can see, it's on the far edge of our fringe area, uh, uh, the purple fringe area there. Um, because the property is within the city's two mile fringe area, area though, uh, it is subject to that agreement. Um, and the city makes a recommendation as is indicated in the letter to the county board. I'm uh, showing that again a little bit closer up and it's uh, where it lies within the fringe area. Um, it's in, again, fringe area B outside of the city's growth boundary. And again, they're requesting residential development. Staff does use two criteria in reviewing the fringe area rezoning, including compliance with the comprehensive plan and the existing neighborhood context. Um, the fringe area agreement is a component of the city's comprehensive plan. Um, it applies to areas outside of our current city limits, but still within an area of influence that we'd like to have uh, the ability to make comment on, depending on whether it's inside or, or outside of growth boundaries, slightly different um, comments are made. Which staff does rely on that fringe area agreement for guidance on, in these cases. As far as compliance with the county's comprehensive plan, the future land use map of the county's comprehensive plan does designate this area as appropriate for residential, shown in the yellow boxing here. Um, you can see the slightly bluish outline of the property kind of in the center right of the, of the yellow area. And the proposed zoning designation would comply with the county's comprehensive plan. As far as neighborhood compatibility, the applicant is requesting, again, a residential zoning that would allow for essentially three single family lots of approximately one dwelling unit per acre. And the surrounding area is largely comprised of farmland and rural residences of a similar type. Um, this is a particular portion of American Legion Ro Road. It's home to a moderate collection of such homes. And the collection is the largest grouping of homes found throughout the fringe area. And given these pre-existing surrounding staff, uh, does find that the requested rezoning would result in a use that is in character and context with the existing neighborhood. As far as steps in the uh, development process, we're here on the orange highlighted step, which is a rezoning. This would go through a subdivision process as well to create those lots, which does have additional touch points with the city uh, for making recommendations, both through the Planning and Zoning Commission and yourselves. Um, based on the review of the relevant criteria, staff recommended approval of the proposed rezoning. And the rezoning does align with the county's comp plan. It is in character, as I mentioned, with the surrounding area. 
Um, the draft land use policy direction is currently being updated, so we acknowledge that it's not con entirely consistent with the current fringery agreement, but staff is working um, on revising that um, agreement so that it would bring this into alignment. That's been in the process since the county updated their comprehensive plan, and we were made aware that there were some points in the county and the city's fringe area that were no longer consistent with each other. At their September 2nd, 2021 meeting, the Planning and Zoning Commission concurred with staff by a vote of seven to zero to also recommend approval of this uh, application to you tonight. Um, the fringery agreement draft that's being revised will be making its way through the Planning and Zoning Commission in October and should actually come to you in the next month or two. So we're hoping to resolve those conflicts and get that agreement updated. Um, that concludes my staff report. If you have any questions, I'm more than glad to answer them. Any questions for Danielle? Is the applicant here? Do you know Danielle? Yeah, the applicant is here tonight. Um, Mike Welch with Axim. He's happy to answer questions if you have them, but he does not have a presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Would anyone from the public like to address this topic? If so, please come forth and we'll allow you up to three minutes at this time. Seeing no one, council discussion. Roll call, please. Fergus? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 12 is facilitate our agreement for ad hoc truth and reconciliation commission. Resolution authorizing the procurement of facilitator for the ad hoc truth and reconciliation commission. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So, so moved, move, Thomas. Oh, second, Mims. Moved by Thomas, seconded by Mims. And um, yeah, just a just a brief introduction. At your last meeting, you authorized or approved the budget uh, that would enable the hiring of a facilitator. Uh, since that last meeting, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has met, uh, received a presentation from the proposed uh, facilitator and uh, unanimously recommended approval of that facilitator to you tonight. I believe that was an 8-0 vote. Um, uh, the uh, representatives from the facilitator group are available via phone. If you have questions of them, uh, we'll be able to patch them in. And there may be members of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission here tonight that can talk about their deliberation process as well. Thank you. And that was our city manager, Jeff Rowan. Anyone um, from the TRC want to say anything before we get started? We're going to ask for the public to come up. Please sign your name. And then we're going to give you up to three minutes to speak. And welcome. Please give us your name and your address. Good evening. My name is Selena Martin. I am the president and CEO of Help, Hope, and Love Foundation. 4440 Preston Lane and 1550 Deerfield Drive. I do have a quick question. Did I hear that they already passed the facilitator? Was that passed and voted on? What I'll just tell you is that the council is here to vote Tonight. to give the final vote. Okay, because I, I was just changing up last time. I'm like, oh my goodness, did I miss it? Okay, sorry. Okay. So first of all, I would like to thank the mayor and the committee for their commitment to having discussions on systemic racism. Unification is so important. Even while we have varying opinions, we can disagree respectfully, and we need everyone to feel welcome to the table to discuss, so thank you so much, okay? First, I will start by saying, please start the Truth and Reconciliation Commission over, or have the community come together to state how we should proceed to accomplish the goals of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Also, we have local experts. We do not need to reach outside of the community at this point for a facilitator for $198,000. We have people that are committed and grassroots in Iowa to help to get this going. So I would really ask that you all reconsider, open back up to the Iowans for our specialists and experts to apply for this facilitator position. 
those are the only things I have, and I just want to thank you all so much for hearing that. Thank you. Welcome. Tracy John Sargent, 3341 Tulane Ave. Um, I didn't know I was going to have to follow Selena. That was uh, obviously very uh, passionate and, and convicted uh, opinion. I share that opinion. Um, I've spent the last several years trying to work in various forms of addressing uh, systemic racism, trying to address racial equity. I'm deeply concerned at the idea of using a firm out of state to do some work. I work every day with an individual that I believe is incredibly qualified to do this work. I'm not sure how that was missed, but I would encourage the council members to strongly consider the talent that we have here uh, in the state, uh, specifically in our local community. If you remember the presentation earlier, there was a comment about those closest to the problem are typically closest to the solution. And I think those of us here in this community that work on racial equity on a daily basis are the most qualified to help address some of those issues. So I would encourage the council to consider that uh, in their vote tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, I'm Supervisor Roy Sam Porter, 136 Apple News Court. And I would just like those that's uh, members of the Black Voices to please stand with me while I read a letter from us. And then if you want to say anything afterwards, you can, but I would ask that y'all stand here with me while I read this letter. I am Roy Sam Porter, and I am here with other members of the Black Voices Project to oppose the hiring of an out-of-state firm to provide the leadership for the Iowa City Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The current membership of the TRC, as well as the majority of the city council, is out of sync with the wide cross-section of the black community that does not support this. This firm, Kearns and West, does not have any connection in our community or with members of the black community in Iowa City. We have no reason to trust them to guide us to a public airing of the truth of our experience in Iowa City. Within the black community, our lived experience and our ancestors before us have taught us to be careful with who we trust. It takes time to build a relationship and it's not possible for an outsider to gain that trust in a matter of a few months. A few months is all that remains of the original TRC charter since it has spent nearly a year in organizational chaos. There are qualified professionals here in Iowa City who can take on the restorative work needed to accomplish the goals of the TRC and who already have connections and a foundation of trust within the community. You as a council have already heard this message from our own Mayor T and our Mayor Pro Tem, Mazahir Saleh. By insisting on pushing forward with this plan to spend nearly $200,000 to bring in outsiders to lead this work, you are, you are showing extreme disrespect for the black leaders elected to our community. They have their finger on the pulse of the black community Listen to them. You may be frustrate, frustrated to see your well-intentioned commission not producing the results you expected. This is hard work. We all acknowledge that truth. It will not be made easier by bringing in outsiders. At this point, it is time to regroup, reappoint, and reconnect. They just gave you the reconnect with the community. Thank you. Thank the commissioners for working through a steep learning curve and helping us all learn some hard lessons about ourselves and our community. We believe it is, a, it is vitally important to seek the truth of the black community in Iowa City and advance reconciliation for many wrongs, past and present. To avoid future wrongs, you need to take these lessons and start again with people and processes that honor and respect the many truths of lived experiences of black Iowa City. Thank you. I did allow that to go a little beyond the beat because there are multiple people that won't be speaking. Welcome.
wow, I feel so lonely. <laughs> uh, I'm Orville Townsend, 713 Whiting Avenue. And I come before you this evening to ask you to stop and reset on your commission. I request that you disband the current commission and start over. The reason I feel this way is because this commission is a result of chaos in our city. I think we reacted to chaos and we made decisions to just put things in order so that we could be comfortable. This is not about being comfortable. You have guided our city. You've done a wonderful job, but it's because you look at tasks, you identify tasks, you identify what needs to be done, you put your planning in place, you look at the outcomes that you want, and then you set about trying to establish them and achieve them. I think we can do that here. This amount of money that you're talking about spending, it's not going to help white and blacks become more familiar with each other. It's not going to create situations that put us together. But if you stop and you decide you want to take a different approach, you can make positive things happen. But please, don't let your final end be the result of an appeasement to chaos in our city. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, hi, <clears throat> Pastor Anthony Smith, uh, New Creations International Church and uh, Johnson County Interfaith Coalition. I, I think enough has been said. I, I can't say any more than what has been said by, my, uh, by uh, the people that have already been before us. And, but I do, I will say this, I, I, I believe that this um, uh, this project should be put on pause. It should be rethought, and that and and that the and that you you've already heard from the people that are doing. These are the people that are doing the work in your city. Why would you go anywhere else to look for for solutions when these are people that have been putting their heart, their soul, and their and their, in, in this community for years. There's no reason why we should look in any other direction than within. Because we live here. We li this, is, this, is our, this, is our, this is our community. And we know how to fix ourselves. And to be honest with you, it is almost a slap in the face to say that we can't, un we can't figure out how to fix our own community. We know the answers. And we don't need anybody else to come from any other city, from any other state, from anywhere else. If you would just spend more, if you want to spend some money, spend some money talking to us. And you'll find the answers that you need. Thank you. Welcome. Mohammed Teriori, Chair of Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, just want to start out by saying thank you everyone for your words thus far and for your opinions. Um, but I would just like to ask if any of these opinions have been given after listening to our full two hour interview with the facilitator group, because it was made very clear during the lines of questioning and we were very careful with the lines of questioning to ensure that this was a process that they would have input on, but anything that would actually be settled and go into the concrete process would be voted on by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Additionally, in our meeting last week, we debated for, I think, a little over an hour about the prospect of making sure that we did have community involvement throughout the entire process, because that was something that we were all very wary about. The reason that conversation last week went so long was because we were also not really knowing if it was appropriate to move forward without more community input. And then at this point, we then heard 
that when it came to this actual group, that they have successfully worked with communities all across the country and also in other parts of the world. And they are still continuing to keep those connections. We interviewed their references, something else that we took the time out of our days to do. And these references all spoke highly of them. People across the country speak highly of them. So I don't understand why it is that we are not listening to the TRC meetings and hearing that this facilitator group is not going to have the ultimate say-so on how things are done, that the TRC and that the community will. I also wrote an op-ed a few weeks ago calling for everyone in the community to actually participate in this process. Purposely wrote this op-ed for release prior to the interview with the facilitator so that they could speak on this because we want the community to be involved. At no point since the TRC was reconstituted has the Black Voices Project actually been at a TRC meeting that I do know of, and that's nothing against them. I just want to know why we can't have a dialogue and why we can't work this out, because I would like them to be a part of this process, and I do believe that they should have some more say in how this goes. But I also think that there are over 70,000 other people in this community that are going to be affected by all of this and that we do need to hear from. For me, myself, I think that we all need to realize that each of us is only one voice in this process, and it isn't just one group or another group, no matter where they're from, that's going to dictate how all of this pans out. It comes down to everyone in all cross-sections of this community actually coming together, working for truth-telling, fact-finding, and reconciliation. Because as we were told, this reconciliation process is not going to end with this commission. It's going to go for years on end. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, Cliff Johnson, also a part of the Truth and Re a volunteer uh, for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, I, I feel like, as a boxer, I know what a punching bag is. And I feel like that's what we are at this point. Uh, pretty much just a punching bag. As of right now, I feel like we're volunteers who uh, joined up to do something. And as a volunteer who joined in after whatever chaos took place that I had nothing to do with, I feel like uh, a lot of punches have been thrown unnecessarily in our direction where we're trying to uh, step up to the plate and take care of a lot of the issues that are around. <coughs> I have not heard one phone call at all during any of our meetings to try to reach out and to connect. And that's what I thought as a city we're supposed to be doing. We're trying to reach out and connect to each other to try to make a better city for all of us. I don't understand why no one has been in contact with us yet have such harsh criticism over people who are volunteering and stepping up to the plate. There is a lot of groups that have been around for a long time and I appreciate each and every single one of them and I am very thankful that they're around and I would hope that these same groups could work with us in making a better future for all of us rather than we just replace again. A reset button constantly gets worn out and then nothing gets anywhere and everything falls under the carpet. I feel like it makes no sense for us to reset again and again and again, and especially in, as far as I'm concerned, unprofessional ways of handling situations that <laughs> left an opportunity for me to step in in the first place. I fully support my fellow TRC members. I've watched them myself beforehand and after uh, in the community, putting in a lot of hard work and it, it, I feel like it gets ignored. I would hope in the future uh, we can work together on things a little bit more, and I, don't, I, I would like to stand by. I really don't believe we should be uh, terminated. It doesn't make sense to me, not if we're trying to move forward. Uh, who we have right now that are on standby, uh, I, I have not found any reason why someone from outside can't help. I do understand we do have a lot of great leaders here, and you're very appreciated, absolutely, in every sense of the matter. However, there is no reason why we shouldn't have extra help, and especially with people who have dealt with these issues and all over the world. There is more than Iowa City here, and there's more, there's people from all different places here as well, and constantly coming in. Outside perspective is not a bad thing, 
And at the end of the day, we're all supposed to be on the same team, not throwing punches at each other. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Anthony Curran, and I live at 11 Metric Road. Uh, I guess I'm a French person. I'm the French part of Iowa City, unincorporated. Um, however, I had been selected to be a, a commissioner in the original uh, iteration of the Commission of Truth and Reconciliation, that ad hoc commission. But I, I resigned, and I stated my reasons very clearly. I come from a tradition that says, to find your leader, you don't go to the person that calls themselves a leader. No. If the person is calling themselves a leader, they could be an activist, they could be a concerned citizen. But to find out who a leader is, you watch to see who's following. We will never follow this Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was ill-conceived. I have tried to be civil. And I have tried to speak to the persons who created the resolution. I have tried, and it has fallen on deaf ears. It is a slap in the face to this community that we have a city council that is being led by BIPOC people. However, this resolution was created without their input. It was not from the mayor, not from the mayor pro tem. You had right there a microcosm, a slice of an African American and an immigrant who could talk with you and perfect a more better resolution. No black people had any input in this. As a matter of fact, I know a very prominent recognized leader that begged and implored you, please don't make it all BIPOC. Again, it fell on deaf ears. So no, it, this is doomed. And as good stewards of taxpayer revenue, I ask you to disband the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because our community will never follow them because they were not from the community being raised up. They were handed to us and we were told to follow them and this is not a good steward of tax base $200,000. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, V. Fixmore Rise, uh, 437 South Governor Street. Um, so I'm the CEO and founder of a local planning firm and we do environmental and community planning and we're really focused on racial justice and social equity. And one thing I just wanted to bring into the conversation is kind of something that we had talked about earlier, which was, you know, um, infusing resources into leaders that are already into the community. And it seems as though, and I, I just want to acknowledge the, the true, the, the long work that goes into that and, you know, trying to find a facilitator, trying to do all that stuff. As somebody who does it every day, I know how hard that is. And I know that there's been a lot of work um, and I just want to acknowledge that on many sides. Um, and I think that if you're looking to build trust, if you're looking to build support within the community as to what you're doing, it is difficult to bring somebody in from the outside. Um, even as you know, much success as they have, um, that can be a very difficult task. And I think what I hear a lot right now in this space is, um, well, actually what I don't hear a lot of is healing. And I think that that's something that is core to actually gaining and building that trust. And so when you're looking to have facilitators come in, or if you're looking for leaders who are actually willing to do the work, we actually need to be talking about healing. And so I would just put that forward um, as something to consider when you're looking at a very costly facilitator experience. And I'm sure they're probably good, at, very good at what they do. 
Um, and uh, at the same time, I do think that we have those people, those proclaimed or unproclaimed leaders um, in our community that are closest to the problem and also could use those resources, quite frankly. I mean, I, I think that um, it would be a good path towards starting that healing road if we could think about like the folks that are already here and how to support and build that community right in Iowa City, right in Johnson County. So um, that's just what I wanted to kind of bring into it is like a lot of healing and a lot of love. I think that, you know, there's, there's been a lot of chaos, there's been a lot of pain, and um, I think that we have leaders here who can lead a process that will really make a difference in our community. So thank you. Angie Welcome. Jordan, hi there. Angie Jordan, 1125 Apple Court. Um, I wasn't gonna speak tonight. I had a lot of things I wanted to hear and follow up with after the meeting, but I do feel moved and I don't really know what I'm gonna say. But I will say that I typically think of the interesting, the, the healing, the love, the icky, the gross, the hard, the I don't wanna do, the discomfort, all for me fits into curiosity, right? And my most powerful conjunction those of you who know me, is and. There's but, there's or, um, and those get used a lot. And so, again, I don't know exactly what I'm saying here, but I'm asking the council, in all decisions TRC, but in general, with these buts and ors, when you see those, please look for the and. Where can we have it all? Where can we have the outsider perspective? And, 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 and tap our resources in a sustainable way? Where can we have the trauma be held, the old trauma, the new trauma, the recently recreated trauma, um, the self-imposed trauma, and how can that be with the healing and the future? I'm not coming here with answers. I'm just asking y'all to be curious and looking for the and, and I don't know where that is. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Twice. Only one time. But, yep, please step over here. And there is a sign-in that you can do after you. One of you can speak first, and then you can sign in after. My name is Bernadine Franks. Uh, I live at 2500 Muscatine Avenue. I work for Faith Academy, uh, Family Liaison. I've also worked in this community as a um, uh, substance abuse professional at uh, It's Now Prelude. I was there when it was Mecca. I was a manager for um, uh, chemical dependency services at another hospital here in Iowa City as well. And so I've been um, in a number of, and I was also uh, served as a, um, elder at a local black church here in our city for a number of years. I've been in this community uh, for a long time. I've seen a lot of things. I've uh, worked with a lot of uh, uh, professionals who, in my uh, opinion, would be more than experienced for this job. I've heard the, the uh, term passed around, it would be a slap in the face to have someone to come from outside, I would be personally offended and feel as if I had been slapped to have somebody to come in. As many professionals as we have in this community that I know of personally that are more than able to do this job. I thank all, I thank all of you that have done work in this area for the, for the time you've spent, for the hours you've labored thus far, but I am asking now that you reconsider bringing somebody else from the outside into our community to do a job that we're more than able to do. Not only do I ask that, I pray that you do that. As a Christian woman, I believe 
that all things are possible, according to Mark 9, 23, if you only believe. I believe in my mayor. I believe in this council. And I believe in the members of the community. I couldn't have said anything else that uh, Roxanne did not already say. And I thank you for your work and your time and your dedication and all that you have given this community. Pastor Tony, I thank you for coming out tonight and doing that. People have other things that they could have been doing, but this is important to them. They took the time to come out and speak on this. You know, I only have an opinion. I'm sorry that my opinion is not the same as someone else here who would want somebody to come into the community, but we have the right to disagree. But I'm disagreeing with him strongly that we do not need this other committee to come in and do what we are able to do. I thank you and advance for not, you know what, you know what, all of you are, are members of this community. Not only am I aware of what, this, what, what the members of this community do, all of you are too. All of you are more than have seen the people that we have and the caliber of people that live in this community. You know what they are capable of and that we don't Thank need you. anybody Thank else. You. Please reconsider this. Thank you. My name is Marion Coleman, and I guess I've been in the Iowa City community since dirt, and so I'm pretty familiar with what goes on now. I must say I live in the county, so I'm really not able to participate in much that goes on with city and city council and commissions. But just a little background, I was equity director for the Iowa City Community School District in this district for 40 years, 25 years as federal compliance for the Iowa City Community School District, principal at several of our schools. I learned when I was working for the school district that we don't make policies for outside communities. When I dealt with something called Halloween one year, I had folks from all over the country sending me hate mail saying we were the mind control people and we did not respect tradition. We do respect tradition. And when we were working in the school district, every school had a different culture. And the people who led the school district had to realize that they had to blend all those cultures together in order to make this community what we wanted for our children. I don't mind not being a part of city commissions. I know I could be a part of Johnson County commissions. But I want to be a part of what we do now. I have worked so hard. And as equity director, I notice exclusion of people in leadership position. Right now, I'll tell you, you probably heard it before, I'm the only African American administrator to ever retire from the Iowa City School District. Now, that's because we don't listen. And a part of what Black Voices is about is helping us to start to listen more and to pay attention to what people are saying. I don't know the person that is supposed to come in from the outside, but the learning curve is going to be huge. There are so many people with so many attitudes and ideas and political beliefs that we're going to have a very difficult time trying to decide what we want that person to focus on. In addition to that person, getting himself acclimated to this community. Yes, we do have people from all over, and we are blessed and fortunate to have the university here. They bring in lots of folks that we learn from. I work with ESL students. I had to do visas. I had to do all kinds of things. I had to decide whether it was a visitation visa or something that we had to do, but they were alien students, and by law, we had to have them in our schools. We don't have any laws regulating how you make decisions because you are a body of very intelligent, hardworking people. Thank you. Thank I you. I wish that you would not. Thank you. Make a decision knee jerk. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address council at this time? You've already addressed council, sorry. 
Would anyone else like to address council at this time? I have a question for him. Anyway, because we can ask the city manager or the Trusan TRC. You can ask the TRC yes. a question, yes. Yes. Uh, Muhammad, you said early, thank you Faris for everything you do. Uh, you said early, like, yeah, we're gonna bring somebody from outside, but that doesn't mean we are not gonna use people locally. Uh, is that means the 190 something, uh, almost $200,000 will I, be the same budget? Could I just interrupt? Only because the TRC, they don't have a majority here. So just be careful as when you continue. It, he may not represent the, they're not here to really engage. I will only comment on what has already been agreed by the commission. Okay. Yeah, be, because you already said that. So I'm just asking just to clarify that yeah we are approving budget for like almost 200,000 for the facilitator and my understanding when i listen to the discussion that you have with the facilitator that they this 200 almost 200,000 will go to them and all of them are not local when you say you're going to use people local are you thinking about adding hiring another people locally to do your job beside that means you're going to pay them money outside the 200 that you're going to give to the facilitator. If that means the people you're going to hire to do things locally will be another people different from those the outsider. Yes, and from Karan and West, that's what I yes, say. this has been covered since our work session, uh, our last work session with you all. That's why the original two budgets had the line items in there for payment to community collaborators and organizers because we have been cognizant of that fact since we have begun this conversation. And the only reason it was removed from this budget proposal is because we are aware that you can vote on specific line items and choose to reject the entire budget if the entire budget is brought in. The facilitator is, would then be available to assist us with bringing a better budget forward that is more clear, that has better steps laid out, so you can then make a decision based off of every line item and how it is planned out in terms of months that each uh, disbursement would need to be made. And additionally, so we can also have a concrete plan on how everyone can also participate and also figure out how exactly they would like to participate. Rather than having a budget line item on there of just saying community collaborators and participants and not knowing exactly how we would compensate them for their work. Okay. My other question is, are you and the commissioner aware that the $1 million is not for TRC only? I'm only as aware as I can be from what I have continually asked all of you since March, uh, since Eleanor Dilks actually was still with the city, have been asking exactly how much of that million is allocated for use by the TRC. And to date, I still have not received a concrete answer on that. Uh, the only thing I do know is that I have been told that if there are other budgetary needs required, that we are allowed to request more budget f money from you. But you are aware that the one million is not, yes, yes or no, aware that it's not only for TRC? Yeah. Yes, I am aware. I'm just not aware of what it, amount you are all wanting to allocate to the TRC because that has still not been made clear. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. And we, we really can't get into having more people, people come up a second time to speak. Sorry about that. So if you've already spoke, we're still, in, this in, we're, we we're still in public. To what you're talking about, I have a question. And the council can engage. I'm only answering questions from the council from what the TRC has already spoken on and already spoken on with the city and nothing else. And all of this has been public information now for either weeks or months, depending on when it has occurred. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else that hasn't had a chance to address would like to address the council at this time? Welcome. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, my name is Chastity Dillard. I am a TRC member. I'm out of breath because I'm running late. I just had work. But I just wanted to re reiterate what everyone has already said, that I absolutely believe that we do need a facilitator, especially a facilitator group of this caliber and the strength in the, everything that they have, they have proven and put to us in the, on the table. Um, 
we need this in this community. I heard a little bit that people are concerned that we're not going to include the community input, but that is not the case. We want to hear from everyone. Um, I just joined the TRC in May, and this we've been it's been going on for almost a year now, and we're still at the same place. So uh, it is very imperative that you allow us to move forward and do exactly what we need to do so we can make this community as great as we need it to be. So this is all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic at this time? I'm Billy Townsend, 713 Whiting Avenue. I think we have, we've been here before. Uh, my husband and I have both been on lots of commissions here in Iowa City because we have a passion for making this the best community that we can live in. It bothers me that you join a commission that's a volunteer. You know, it's a volunteer position when you come on. And then you ask for salary. You ask for babysitting. And now you ask for $200,000 for a facilitator to come in and fix the problem. We all know what the problem is. We just need to get along better. So I hope that, that the city council will take it on good faith that we start again, this time with representation from every area of the BIPOC community, not just the younger generation. There's no one on that commission that's anywhere close to where my husband and I are. And we've been in this community for myself over 30 years, him over 40 years. So I think we need to regroup, start again, and do it the right way so we can get the job done. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic before I close public comment? Thanks to all of the public that have come up and spoke at this time. And I'm going to open it up to council discussion. I'll start. Um, I have a feeling nobody wants to say anything at this point. <laughs> I feel, um, I feel like, quite frankly, we are in an absolutely no-win position right now as counselors. And let me explain why I feel that way. When we started with the TRC, um, we were, you know, getting a lot of input, a lot of um, pushing to do things a certain way, um, a lot of don't tell us how to do it, let us, you know, figure it out. We don't want this, you know, totally managed by the city. We want independence with this commission, et cetera. I think in that process, I think we, we made a mistake, but I'm not sure if we had done it differently, we would have found ourselves necessarily in any better position. And so we put together a commission with, with a resolution that was, you know, supported by this council, regardless of who drafted it, was supported by this council, um, that basically laid out the what we wanted for end results but with not any structure to it and that's really different because when anybody is appointed to any of our city commissions typically they are walking into an environment where there are existing members with an existing structure with you know bylaws in place and so they come in as one or two new members maybe at a time and, and get acclimated into that whole process. Here we dropped nine people into a room with no structure, with probably the most difficult job of any commissions that we have ever appointed. Okay, we went through, uh, went through the turmoil um, of that commission with resignations, with putting them on pause, with appointing new people, and now trying to move forward. And what we're seeing is obviously a significant division within the BIPOC community about what we should do and how we should move forward. 
with those people who are on there and have been working on it, feeling like we should continue with the process that has been going for months after we restarted, they're making progress, and with other people in the community who feel like that's not the way to go, we should shut it down, we should start all over. We, as a city, put out a proposal, a request for proposal for a facilitator for this commission. Um, it is my understanding that that, and I would assume our city staff has done thing every, by all of our regulations and state laws, et cetera, to put out an RFP. And is my understanding we got one response to that RFP. We did not get a response from any person or organization locally. I don't know why, but we didn't. Okay. I sit here as an elected city council member thinking and to myself, we have followed a process and we have we have a, a, an applicant or a response to that RFP from an organization that has an incredible, incredible reputation nationally for doing this work. They go into lots of communities where they have no presence. All right? They come in as outsiders to facilitate, to help the people in that community to do the work that needs to be done. The people that have relationships and know the community. And so I look at that and the process, and so to me it seems logical to continue to move forward with that. Do I wish that we had had multiple responses to that RFP? Do I wish that we had had multiple local groups who had put their expertise forward and said, hey, we can do this? Absolutely. I absolutely wish we had had that. We did not. My concern now as I sit here is, to a certain extent, I see the council in an absolutely no-win position. If we vote for this, Okay, I think we, we see a very divided BIPOC community, and particularly, uh, I think it's a, to a certain extent, a generational divide. We have people who have worked in this community as activists and, and volunteered on commissions for decades who have done an absolutely fantastic job, and I thank all of you for that. I've known a lot of you for a long, long time and I support and appreciate the work that you've done. Okay. And so I'd, I would like to, conti I'd like to continue my, I'd like to continue my comments without interruption from the audience, please. We respected your comments. I would appreciate that same respect. I do not, I do not see this as an easy decision. I absolutely do not. I see this as a division within our community that no matter which answer we give, there is a side of the community that is going to say that we are absolutely wrong, we should have done it a totally different way, and they are absolutely justified in everybody's own opinion. Okay. But as a city councilor, I believe in process. And I believe we gave an opening to everybody to respond to that RFP and to offer their expertise in this process. So the point I'm sitting at right now to my fellow counselors, depending on what I hear from the rest of you, I am hard pressed not to go ahead and support the hiring of, these, of this group to come in and facilitate so that the TRC can do the work we've asked them to do, and we still will be asking for and needing the input from the community members. If we shut this down, I'll tell you right now, I'm done as a counselor. I'm done with trying to work on any kind of a TRC. 
I got about four months left. It's like, you all figure it out. Because we've had a process in place. We've tried to work through that process. If we turn this down now, I don't think there's anything this council can do that's going to be accepted by the community as a whole. I, I really appreciate your words um, and, and, and what you said. I, I, I hear you. I really do. And it is a challenge that we're in. Something that was mentioned by one of the newer TRC members was that, you know, they feel like a punching bag. And I hear you. I agree. When we reset the TRC at no fault of anyone, we, we thought we were pausing because there was turmoil that we knew we couldn't continue with the TRC as it was. And when we came back, we didn't have the foresight to honestly start it all over. If we as a council cannot see, the thing that is most important is healing within the BIPOC community. That, that is very clear to me. There needs to be healing. And so if we are going to move forward, I've said it time and time again, we need to restart, reimagine how we get the goals set forth by the TRC. I am not giving up. I am fully dedicated to the goals of the TRC. This is real work that me and all the people in this room, we live through this systemic racism. We want change. We want it now. But we won't be able to get it the way that things are now. Healing is imperative for us to move forward. You know, the, you know, Angie Jordan, who we all love and respect, you know, talked about the and and the but, you know, not really knowing the answers right now, don't have anything to offer, but to come and listen. But the one thing that she said is we need the plus, that's the healing. We can't ignore that there is so much turmoil and we need to move forward. You know, the other thing I have to tell you, I, I've listened to the TRC meetings, and I want to tell the TRC members, um, especially those new ones that have come forth, I've, I've seen how you all engage, and I so respect it. I really listen to you all, and I see how you interact. I do believe that the, you know, there are some dynamics that you know, um, may be happening. I'm, I'm a leader, so I notice dynamics among groups um, that might be happening. Um, the, the unification that is needed because we do see the division, I really believe that we have to deal with it and we cannot go forth. On this vote of the uh, uh, Kearns and West, you know, coming in from, uh, to provide this facilitation work, it was not until we started having a conversation here where Councillor Thomas said, we're really wanting a project manager, you know, to come in and kind of tell us, you know, help us, not tell us, help us with this process. And as he was talking and as he was talking and I was learning some of the things that they could offer, that's when it became very apparent to me what was going before the TRC should have been coming to council at the beginning to help us develop the whole structure of the TRC, their expertise could have, it, because at that point, I, I, I have to tell you, Mayor Pro Tem and I were grieving George Floyd. We were grieving George Floyd. We were also grieving and, and wanted to also make sure that we had time to express that we want change, we want it now. There was a lot going on. But, at, but we didn't have the foresight to bring in people to kind of give us some advice. We went to some um, seminars online because everything was high COVID on how to move forward. 
we didn't we didn't so i there's no fault of no ones i think this council i i know each one of your hearts every last one every i know your heart at one in the change that is so necessary for this community and i will tell you tonight that we need healing this is you know the facilitator is really not the topic it, it, it shouldn't be the topic, but it is the topic. It's the item on the agenda. So I would implore, implore all of us to not vote for this tonight. Let us then come back and have some community input on what steps are next. Because if we don't have the healing, we will not be successful as a community with this TRC. Thank you, Mayor Teague. That, it's hard to follow that. Um, but I, I would like to state, first of all, I want to thank the members of the public who took the time to come before us to speak on this. I appreciate your comments and have very deep respect for each of you. You know which ones you are. Uh, as counselors, we were all 100% in favor of the creation of the TRC. However, it's been obvious that this group has needed help with uh, direction and clarity towards achieving their objectives. It just hasn't been done, and it's been almost a year. But at what cost should that come? That seems to be the big question here tonight. And when I was thinking about that question in my mind, I kept hearing the phrase Councillor Mim. Mims has often said regarding many other items judiciary responsibility and I'm surprised that I haven't heard that uh, because I don't see that as this this is you know that means to prudently or cautiously take care of money matters and I don't see that with this and the longer that I have taken to think about this proposal the more questions I have about the process that took place in the selection of this company normally when we start an RFP uh, process there's a period of time when the request is posted and with all due respects to Councillor Mims, I'm not clear on what that process was for the posting of this RFP. I, I don't recall seeing it. Um, and was it a national search, or, or how did this come about? Uh, also with RFPs for city projects, we like to see more than one bidder, and oftentimes uh, a selection is not made when there's only one applicant. Uh, we also um, see comparative bids for the cost, and we, we didn't see that. And to me, this bid is over what we would, uh, what would be appropriate for the time frame that we have left, it's just a few months, just doesn't seem rational for this cost for the short time frame from now until uh, next June. Uh, and considering the proposal uh, fee uh, from this one firm, I would encourage uh, a broader search as soon as possible with a more transparent and competitive process, preferably choosing, obviously, someone from uh, local, the process. I would be voting against it. Mayor, I feel like I, I need to clarify the, the procurement process. The, the city staff guided the procurement process um, as we would any other process. So we, the, the TRC did not create the process themselves. Um, we guided them through that. We put that through our normal channels. Uh, we published that notice like we would uh, any other um, uh, any other process. And uh, you know, in, in this case, we had one response. And and you know, you've seen a number of these on projects. There are times where we feel like we don't get sufficient responses. We'll go back out and we'll try again. And there's other times where we feel like the one response that we get or the one bid what we get is sufficient and we move forward. So I just want to clarify that th this wasn't a, um, a new process or a process that was conceived by the commission. It was guided by the same professional staff that guides all of our procurement processes here at the city. And Jeff, uh, can you just add uh, like how long was the process for, like how the advertising time? Um, I, I'd have to go back and get the exact dates. My guess uh, is that it was, it was probably somewhere in the three to five weeks um, in terms of getting proposals back, but I might be able to find that out here if I look it up. That's okay. In the spirit of the and of Angie Jordan, 
Um, I would actually, I think it might be at least useful if we have the proposed contractors, the proposed project leaders or facilitators on the line to ask them how they pr approach communities that they clearly do not know and, and why they as a firm believe that this sort of work is a highly specialized work um, that, and how they have managed to do it in other communities. Um, we have heard a lot from this community, from many people who are, are highly respected in this community. We know that there's a great deal of healing that needs, that needs to happen, both within the commission and without and within the community. But I would actually be interested in the, in the and of hearing some of the, some hearing from this group, um, because presumably they have been listening to this uh, and they, they have heard the, the, the concerns and the pain and the healing that is needed. Uh, and I think it, given all the discussion that's gone on, that seems to me it would be only fair at this point. I, I would just say that, as I mentioned, it, it, it for me is really not the facilitator. It, it, that's, that's the item on the agenda. I mean, that is, it is the item on the agenda. You're exactly right. It is the item on the agenda. But there is much more that's happening here than this item on the agenda. I personally don't believe now is the appropriate time for, the, um, for them to respond, but that's my personal opinion. I, I mean, not to invite them to respond. I'd be glad to hear from them. I think we need to hear their perspective. I agree with you, Mayor, that what we're talking about is not just the facilitator. That's been clear from the very heartfelt and very helpful comments that we've received this evening. I am one of the individuals that uh, Mr. Curran was referring to who, who drafted this. I acknowledge that. I did so with input from a number of people. And I, I do, I think what we're talking about for the facilitator as well as for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is to provide a framework for the community for healing. That's the intent. That's what the resolution requires. That's the charge of the commission. And we tried a facilitator once before, and we vested our trust in the commission that voted eight to one on the first facilitator, and he chose not to execute that contract. And so we tried again. And at that point, the first process was not a competitive process. We then went with the competitive process to have the request for proposals go out and be open for a long time. I know that the commission uh, took very, very seriously the fact that they only received one response. But I think this divide that we're hearing and that I'm so grateful that all of you were willing to voice and be vulnerable and be open to us here tonight because I'm sure you all had other things you wanted to do. But I think this divide is the kind of thing that the professionals were talking about, the contract that actually is on our agenda for consideration tonight. It's the kind of work they do as professionals. And I think that's why it's important for us to hear from them. But they will fail if we don't partner. I'm gonna just respect, respectfully ask all of the public to keep your comments to yourself, please. Thank you. Well, in terms of hearing from the, um, the consultant, you know, we, as we've been discussing, we're, this is the item on our agenda. It's been a long, difficult road here. And um, in terms of honoring that process, it does seem to me uh, appropriate. I would certainly be interested in, in hearing the uh, consultant's comments at this point. So we do have a majority. Can you get the consultant on the phone? Or did you want to speak first, Mayor Pro Tem? Does it matter? No. We can hear. 
Yeah, we'll just check with our communication staff right now. If anybody from Kearns and West uh, is able to, to speak, feel free to jump in right now. So just for the, the Kearns and West folks that are on the line, we, we can't quite hear you yet, so if you can just give us a minute, we're, we're working on it. This is Larry Schooler from Kearns and West. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Hey, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. This is Dr. Larry Schooler. I'm the director and senior facilitator with Kearns and West, and I want to thank the Mayor and Council for this opportunity to speak with you all. Uh, Mayor, I'm happy to just uh, help field questions, uh, or if you'd like me to make any kind of introductory remarks, I can. You all would like him to speak so you can ask him what you're expecting. I guess my first question would be if you folks have been listening to the comments that have been made here this evening, your, I believe this is what we're trying to get at, is your response to that and how you feel you either can or cannot come in and effectively facilitate within a community with these issues. Councilmember, thank you very much for the question. And, and I also would like to thank the members of the Iowa City community who offered public input tonight. I've worked in municipal government for more than a decade, and nothing is more important to the policymaking process than the public input that uh, policymakers receive. And in response to your question, um, the TRC members who spoke were, were correct in saying that this is the kind of work we do in communities uh, all over the country. So I've just completed uh, facilitating the Racial Equity and Policing Commission for Salt Lake City, Utah. We are facilitating the Community Task Force on Policing for Elgin, Illinois, and for Vancouver, Washington. We are um, certainly familiar with the challenges associated with being from out of town. And so that we are clear as to the role we understand ourselves to be playing. Um, we're here to facilitate a process that this community and this TRC design. Uh, we are not in a decision-making role as we understand it. We are in a facilitative role. And the only way that the TRC's work will be a success, whether we're engaged with it or not, is if the community uh, defines how the process should look and then participates in that process. And we very much would like to explore the possibility of having our firm's uh, work be uh, done in tandem with community organizations who would receive a portion of the budget that would be allocated to us. We fully understand that 
we have a lot to learn about the Iowa City community and about the particular challenges in Iowa City, regardless of the members of our team who have connections to or roots in Iowa City. And so we would like to be able to leverage our experience doing this kind of work, whether it's equitable engagement, truth and reconciliation, restorative justice, a particular interest in public safety, uh, and partner that and, and marry that with the local knowledge that's been expressed uh, all throughout the evening and that we were aware of even before this evening uh, to produce the kind of TRC process that the community uh, will fully embrace. So again, we, we view ourselves as a, a conduit for the community to have the process that they believe they need to have and to help the community um, create the brave space needed to hear each other's truths and then to effectuate a process of reconciliation. And that's a challenge that we've embraced in many other places and would like to here as well. Have you done any researches about pieback community in Iowa City? Um, I mean, like, what do you know about pieback community in Iowa City? Kyle Vint on our team, I think, is still with us. And um, I know that Kyle has done a significant amount of, of work directly in uh, Iowa City uh, over the course of his uh, career, uh, including his time at the university. And, and Kyle, I don't know if you'd like to just share some information and insight from, from that uh, lived and worked experience. Yeah, Larry, I, I appreciate it. I, I think I would like to be clear about one thing here, Larry and, and um, Counselor, is that my role on this project is not to be um, the ambassador to Iowa City. In my time in Iowa City, I was a student and then eventually a graduate student. I did a significant amount of work at the University of Iowa um, and with the local high school um, communities in, in Iowa City. Um, but my work at, at that time was not focused in the, the BIPOC community, although um, I did work to expand um, access and equity to higher education for the BIPOC community with the organizations that I was involved in. I, I think, um, Counselor, to your specific point, um, uh, the, the purpose of our work here is not to bring our preconceptions of Iowa City to bear, but to hear the experiences um, that are being shared through the commission and by the commissioners themselves um, to elicit a process that helps to identify the community organizations and community groups who can help to lead this pr uh, process forward. And um, in the specific approach that we've defined, um, the, the very first portion of the work that we've identified is to have deep conversations with um, members of the community, members of the commission, and members of the council um, to help get our bearings about the community of Iowa City and to better understand um, the people that need to be proactively um, addressed and reached out to um, to ensure that their voice is elevated and magnified in this process, um, especially as we are working to define the overall approach and um, guide that will be brought in front of council. And, and I would just say, council member, that you know we we can certainly you know do do reading and and textual research about a community, but that's no substitute for getting to know the people who are in that community, being physically in the community, being able to you know walk neighborhoods and talk directly to people, and of course given the procurement process, we've had to be very, you know, limited in the way that we uh, communicate with um, with Iowa City as this process has moved forward. We've had to, to maintain our contact with just one staff person. But as Kyle mentioned, um, in any of our projects, we seek to spend, you know, ample time making sure we hear directly from the people who have lived in the community and who've worked in it uh, to understand the dynamics from their perspective, not just from, you know, articles and data that we could maybe just access remotely. Even if you came to Iowa City, how do you think you can connect with, like, how confident are you by back, are you think that by back people will be engaging with you? Well, Council Member, I, I appreciate the question. And I, I guess the only thing that I can say is that they have when we have worked in a number of other communities. You know, I can only speak for the work that we have done before. You know, I, I certainly understand why people would be distrustful of anyone they don't know, be they out of state, be they of a different race or of a different ethnicity or of a different religion. That distrust is, is certainly understandable. At the same time, um, this is what we do. 
you know, we take on projects where uh, deeply entrenched local communities are asking for uh, a neutral, independent third party to help them uh, work through some of the more challenging issues that they are facing. You know, we are mediators and we have chosen a particular area of subspecialty within mediation and facilitation to work on this very kind of topic. And when we do this work, we do it with very diverse teams of people. Some of us will look like the people with whom we're interacting and some of us won't. Some of us will have similar backgrounds and some of us won't. And it's our duty to make sure that we gain as deep an understanding of their experiences as we can uh, in order to facilitate and to, to help drive consensus as best as we can. So I, I certainly understand and hear the, the concern and I would simply tell you that, you know, we experience that every time we start a project and and nevertheless, we persist and have, you know, been fortunate to, I think, achieve some um, meaningful outcomes for the communities in which we've worked. And so I'm gonna ask another question. As a person who work with uh, BIBA community and Latinos and people of color in general, as a person who I am, a person of color, who immigrants, Muslim, I have a lot of diversity that I can like represent. So uh, I've been working with all those people and what I know about them, no matter who I send you know, to certain community, if they don't know those people, they don't trust them. For example, at the Center for Work, I guess is the way I'm the director, if I would like to speak to Latino about certain issue, if I send a white person who speaks Spanish, they are not gonna trust them. If I send a black person who speaks Spanish, they are not gonna trust them. If I send an Spanish, you know, like a Latino person, if they don't know them, they are not gonna trust them. Are you planning to hire people who look like from the community to do the work? We are, we are ma'am, yes. You're gonna hire we people from Iowa City to do work in Iowa City? We, we are very open to um, including in our work and, and, and in compensating um, those people who feel that they would like to be part of the work, that have the kinds of relationships that you describe that um, don't require any sort of reinvention of the wheel, that can enable us to gain the access into all parts of Iowa City that need to be engaged in this TRC. Of the could I ask a question? Of the $197,000, uh, $97, what of the budgeted item was actually allocated for community involvement? Outreach. Outreach. Well, Mayor, I'm happy to go back and, and pull the budget for you, but I mean, I, I think it's very important to say that this, that a TRC is by its very nature a community driven process it's it's not one that's done by you know consultants in a in a back room or staff it's done by significant engagement with community members who want to share their testimony and participate in the trc's work it's it's very different in many ways from a typical uh, you know advisory board might be and so i'm not sure that i could give you an exact percentage i mean to, to a degree i would say it's a hundred percent because you know we will be spending the vast majority of our time either in publicly held TRC meetings at which the community is invited or community events at which the community is asked to bring their testimony or in other settings, private settings, where our team can be collecting uh, testimony and hosting opportunities for dialogue and reconciliation. So I don't mean to be evasive in, in answering your question, but when we constructed our budget, it, it wasn't necessarily done with an eye towards, you know, this piece is for outreach and this piece is for something else, because the process is by its very nature so extremely transparent, so extremely public. Um, in some ways, it's the most democratic thing that that humanity, I think, has, has done to date in terms of trying to work through uh, the challenges of our time. So I'm happy as, as we continue this conversation, I can try to identify some additional line items, but that's what I would say in, in, the, uh, in brief. I, I just have one last comment, I guess. And this is related to, you've said it a few times now, that this is you know a community-driven process, and you've heard 
um, this community, you know, the community come out and speak. And I can tell you that the voices of those that have come forth and stating that uh, the TRC should be reimagined um, by the community coming to the table to say where we think we need to go from here on out. Um, I don't really know that the word is um, fully distrust you all. I, I have great respect uh, for the work that you do. I do believe that you are experts in this, but Iowa City is unique. Um, we have talent amongst us. And what we're saying is we can do this on a local level. So it's no disrespect to you. And I think that's the challenge here is that it really isn't about you. <laughs> it is about what the community wants and what we believe and what the community is saying they want at this time. So with that being said, what would be your response from what you're hearing from the community? Well, Mayor, first of all, we don't take it as in, in any way disrespect. We, we fully understand the significance of involving or having local leadership. I, I, I hope this doesn't come off the wrong way. We, we simply were made, avail made aware of an opportunity to leverage the expertise and experience that we have uh, to assist a community with truth and reconciliation. And so we submitted a proposal uh, and, and assembled a team based on what was asked of us in that call for proposals. We don't think that this TRC will be successful uh, unless the uh, community can formulate the best uh, approach that will yield the kind of results that they're looking for. And that will require, um, I think, effective facilitation, but it will also require a, um, a robust process for that community to participate in the TRC's work. And, and I don't think we've had that to date. And that's part of what we're, I think, meant to assist with providing. So it, it, it seems to me, as I was listening to the comments tonight, uh, that this community is very much seeking uh, the reconciliation that comes with a truth and reconciliation process, and that perhaps uh, a facilitator can help to um, move this process forward. And I can, I can accept that um, our being from outside the community is, is very difficult and, and upsetting and maybe even disrespectful. And I apologize uh, if we've made anyone feel that way. You know, we simply uh, look for projects that are very much um, aligned with our values as a company, uh, that are connected to our experience and our expertise, and uh, where we think we can add value. Uh, and we still believe that in this case. Um, and would work as hard as we could to have all of the right people at the table of uh, doing this work and uh, included in this work. And Larry, if I may, I, I would just add one item in there on, on top to respond to your um, question, Mayor. This is, this is Kyle Vint, apologies. Um, um, it, you know, we've heard a lot tonight about the need to reimagine um, the TRC, and I think we've heard that, that comment loud and clear and, and understand the perspective um, that's being shared there. One thing that I would just note is that I don't view the TRC structure as sedimented. Um, and I, I think going back to the theme of tonight about the and or the gesture towards and, the very first step in this process is to um, collectively or collaboratively define what the truth telling, the reconciliation, process looks like. And, and our approach to this project starts with interviews and outreach to community organizations and community leaders to hear what um, their perspectives are on the need to structure and define the outreach and engagement within this project. So um, in light of that, I, I think that there is space in here to, to continue to hear those perspectives um, and to include those voices in the process of defining the approach to how this, this process moves forward. Um, does anyone on the Kearns and West team have experience working in a community where the legitimacy of the commission that you're working with or your work is questioned like you're hearing this evening? Uh, Councilmember, the short answer is yes. Um, uh, I'm certainly interested in, in hearing from either of our other team members that are on the line, Sir Omar or Eduardo Gonzalez. Eduardo has worked in truth and reconciliation commissions around the globe, and there has undoubtedly been, um, you know, distrust, skepticism, and, and worse uh, that has faced him and his uh, 
various endeavors, uh, including in the in the Greensboro, North Carolina community, which some of you may be familiar with. I reported on the Greensboro Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, for NPR back in 2004, and that commission struggled to uh, attain the the political legitimacy that it was seeking. Um, but now, some 15 years later. Uh, many of the reforms sought by that TRC have now been implemented by uh, city government or other levels of government. And so that that distrust and that skepticism faces us almost anywhere we go, uh, unless perhaps it's <laughs> our own family or something. And even then they might uh, distrust us. Uh, but I think that we are uh, accustomed to that. Um, you know, certainly we were outsiders in Salt Lake City. We are outsiders in Elgin, Illinois. We are outsiders in Vancouver, Washington. Um, but I think that over time, with the investment of of effort and energy that we place into gaining a deeper understanding of where we are, uh, we tend to see those uh, those bonds of trust be built. But I'm happy to yield to Sarah Eduardo if you wanted to add anything from your experiences. I also want to ask you, uh, when I was listening to your presentation to TRC, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think I heard that you saying you will be in Iowa, like Iowa City six times a year. Is that true? Or that is still going to be six times a year? Or you're going to have, you know, come more than that? Or I don't know how often. Well, Mayor Pro Tem, we for purposes of formulating a budget, we made estimates as to, you know, what it would take for us to travel to Iowa City. And so in the budget that we laid out in order to keep things manageable, we kept uh, a certain number of trips in place. Having said that, uh, we fully believe that once we would be engaged in the work and talking with both the commissioners and the community, we may find that we need to configure our presence in Iowa City very differently and, and be in town more often. Uh, so we want to assure you that, that despite the fact that we've you know, thought critically about our proposal and our proposed budget, um, it, it's still something that has to be worked out by the people who want us to assist them and not by us. So we would envision that uh, any sort of calculation about number of trips would be uh, but would, would be revisited. I also I think that I'm sorry I'm asking too much question. Uh, you know uh, I also think like they're going to be like learning curve for you guys because you are coming from our side. You know Iowa City. Uh, why should I choose you? That it's going to take you a lot of time to figure out how this community will be working then choose like somebody else who's local uh what you going to do to just like shrink that learning curve if you're being chosen because oh. i just believe that you are not from iowa city kyle is not being in a commission like buyback commission or group in university of iowa even those areas he never been in commission, and all you always refer to him as a person who's from Iowa City. I don't think the university, with respect to the University of Iowa, but university and the community are very segregated, you know, and because those students and the community are very segregated, and he being only on that setting. Can you tell I me understand. what you're going to do? I understand, Mayor Pro Tem, and, and I guess I would make a couple of points. First of all, I, I certainly relate to what you're saying about university divides. I'm myself part of the University of Texas and witnessed that firsthand. I would also say that it's important that we remember what we are being asked to do here. We, we are being asked to provide neutral facilitation. We are being asked to assist disparate parts of the Iowa City community with coming together around a shared purpose, a shared direction, and a shared process. And so I understand your concerns about a learning curve. I guess I would just tell you that even even a facilitator um, who is in the um, in the heart of Iowa City uh, would would also face a learning curve, but also would struggle, I think, with um, maintaining the full level of neutrality that would be expected for a facilitator. You know, it's 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 difficult sometimes for people to appreciate. Um, how how a facilitator's uh, job works, but we are expected 
to you know put all of our own you know biases aside all of our own uh you know preconceived notions aside and work on behalf of all of the participants in any sort of process that we're working in and i understand why there is value in our collaborating with uh, members of the local community and we fully intend to do so at the same time uh i think that our um capacity as people who are coming in from outside of the community can assist us in providing the services that you have asked us to provide. And that's what we're here to do. So, you know, I, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you exactly how quickly or how slowly, you know, we will pick up on the things that uh, you all hope for us to, to understand. Um, and I acknowledge that it might take me longer than it would take someone who lives down the street from City Hall. Um, but we also bring a wealth of of experience and expertise doing this kind of work uh, to help to uh, streamline some of the processes of, of as you put it, uh, ascending that learning curve. I'm happy, though, to hear from other members of my team. I'm, I'm not uh, the only voice on our, on our group, Eduardo or Sarah. Thank you. E Eduardo, go ahead. Eduardo. Eduardo. Um, we can't. Your audio is not good, Eduardo. Can't hear you. It's not. It's not. It's garbled. Might want to redial in by phone audio or something, but we can't uh, make out your words or take out the earpieces. Are we can go on to another uh, question, questions? Mayor and Council, if you'd like. Yeah. How about now? No, it's great. Go ahead. Right, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council and members of the public who are there. My name is Eduardo Gonzalez. I am uh, originally from Peru, Latin America. I did work in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission created in my country after the internal conflict that we suffered. It was a conflict that left 69,000 people dead uh, after 20 years of war. Uh, so creating a Truth Commission in those conditions was indeed difficult. And after that work, I have been uh, serving in truth commissions in about uh, 20 countries. And uh, some of those uh, commissions that have not been national commissions, like the Commission of Peru, the Commission of Kenya, the Commission of Tunisia, but local commissions in different parts of the world, including the United States, like uh, Larry mentioned, the Greens World Truth Commission and the main Wapanaki uh, TRC. Um, I just want to make two short points. The first one is that uh, TRCs are established precisely because there are problems of legitimacy, precisely because there are uh, problems of distrust. But I want to say that this distrust is not just a psychological issue. Um, I hear often that truth commissions are about healing, and it is true that healing is important. But uh, the reason why there is no healing is because there is no justice. So truth commissions really are a step towards justice. And that is a fundamental point. Now, that is a very loaded word. And that is probably why truth commissions are not called justice commissions. They are called truth and reconciliation commissions. Because it's probably a way to uh, get into those very difficult and obviously very political and very loaded discussions. Those discussions would be difficult in any normal situation. They are even more difficult when there is suffering and when there are the obvious um, marks of injustice in a, in a community. Communities suffer injustice and therefore suffer trauma, and therefore it is very logical and very obvious that um, trust is going to be very difficult to find. So that is why there is untrust. And that is also why, in my experience, uh, truth commissions appreciate comparative experience and uh, experience from other countries. The Truth Commission in which I worked in Peru received the support of members of the Truth Commission of South Africa. It would have been unwise, in my opinion, to deny the support of people who served in the uh, Truth Commission created by Nelson Mandela. I think it was an important step that we listened to them. The same with the Truth Commission of Chile, the Truth Commission of Guatemala. We listened to all those commissions. And then people who served in truth commissions in Morocco or Tunisia uh, listened to someone from a truth commission in Peru. And I think um, listen to comparative experience can be very useful 
because it um, uh, makes you discover that the problems that uh, you think are intractable probably have been discussed in other places. And certainly there will be elements in which our cases are indeed absolutely unique and you will have to uh, find um, your own way. But that is why the commission is created. I think it is important, and I promise to finish here, to distinguish the role of the commissioners that have already been named by the city council and the facilitator. The commission is the one that leads when you are talking about local leadership, that is exactly what the commission is supposed to do. And it has taken a lot of time to your city to um, get to the point where the commissioners are appointed and are serving. And this commission needs help for them to facilitate and organize some elements of their work. Um, according to the resolution that established the commission, this facilitation serves at the will of the commission. So if the commission itself decides that they no longer need the facilitators, then the facilitators are no longer needed. So this is a, a, an important distinction. The facilitators are there to support the commission, but not to do the work of the commission. The commission has that responsibility. That has been my experience in 20 years time. Obviously, um, the work of a facilitator or an external supporter is precisely to help local commissions to make the learning curve more efficient. Why to invent new things when other truth commissions may have faced exactly the same issue? If this information can be brought to them by an external facilitator, that is actually a good strategy to flatten and to make more efficient the learning curve. So those are, are, are the points I would like to make, and I uh, definitely appreciate enormously the uh, contributions that the public has made. I have a last question. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, yes, I want to ask you, what are you going to do if a like, huge part of the community decide not to involve with you in any truth finding or anything? What are you going to do about that? For me? Go ahead, Eduardo. Yes. Um, Yes, well, that is um, a very good point because that is exactly what happens in many places. Um, there are many reasons uh, for which people may decide not to get involved. Um, first, certainly trauma. Second, self-interest. Um, I have served in commissions after armed conflict and situations of structural injustice, and people who are served by the status quo may not like to participate. So I, I know that. That is why it is extremely important to do efficient outreach. And I think the commissioners you have are uniquely positioned to do that and to uh, persuade people who have something to say to uh, recognize that having a community that is a just community um, is in the interest of everyone. Um, the chairperson of the commission, in fact, published just a few weeks ago a call to all of Iowa City to actually participate in this process. I think that has to be reiterated. Thank you. Mayor Pertem, to... if, I, if I could, I, I just also want to say that there is no public process that doesn't uh, suffer the kind of challenge that, that you're describing. You know, there always are going to be cases where we are public's engagement and for one reason or another are stifled. And in those cases, we ask what we can do differently, but we also proactively ask on the front end, what will make this uh, a meaningful process for you and for the community that you come from? Uh, the International Association of Public Participation, of which I was president, has as one of its core values to have the public you're trying to engage design how they would like to engage. And so rather than our bringing in a box of, of tools uh, and just pulling ones out of the hat, we would be working directly with the people in Iowa City to determine uh, the best combination of tools and, and engagement uh, techniques that would work for this community. Okay, I do want to bring um, council back in the discussion, um, but you did just make mention of one thing and you, you talked about what will make this meaningful to the community. Um, and for me, your qualifications are not in question. Um, I, I think you all have, um, you know, presented that you you can do this work. Um, would you say that our uh, TRC commission cannot f be successful without you? And that's a yes or no. Mayor, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, 
I, I'm not going to answer a, a question like that. Okay, I, no, that's fine. You don't have to. And then the last question I, w I would have is, have you been in any communities where a full restart of the work, whether it's uh, you know reimagining, fixing what's there, have you ever been in a community where you know the TRC has fully stopped and been recreated by the community, which that's what we're hearing here by the community members? I'd say yes, sir, we have. Okay, thank you. Any more questions for Carnes and Wes? Yeah, I had a, I had a couple of questions. I, um, you talked about um, comparative experience. Um, you, talked, you talked some about the importance of, of neutrality and outside perspective. Um, one of the things that we've seen that we've seen clearly um, here this evening and we've seen before are deep fissures within our communities um, and people who uh, and and le and leaders in our community who who have said who have said clearly that they do not see the current commissioners as legitimate or as representative and that they would not work together with them. How do you approach an issue like that? Well, council member, I mean, I, I know that that has happened to commissions uh, around the globe. First of all, it's not unique to Iowa city. I would secondly say that it's, critical when you're dual, dealing with any form of conflict to understand not just the position that someone's taking, but the underlying interests that they have. And so in my particular experience, what I would be striving to do is to understand what it is that renders the current TRC illegitimate in the eyes of the community leader who sang so. And it may be that they engage through a uh, you know, a, a proxy like us. It may be that they don't engage directly with the commission at an event, but engage indirectly. It may be that they have a particular commissioner whom they trust and they want to work just with that commissioner. Um, and there may be something much more significant afoot, and I, I wouldn't dare speculate as to what that is. Um, but as Eduardo mentioned, I mean, the, the, the questions of legitimacy um, uh, hinder commissions like this all across the world and it's it's not new and Eduardo and I in particular are uh, deep students of the ways in which TRCs have managed to overcome questions about their credibility and still uh, engage large portions of the communities that they're trying to serve the populations that they're trying to serve and we would spare no effort to do that here, including to get to the bottom of why those uh, questions of legitimacy have been raised. And I have one final question, which is a sort of that you spoke earlier to some extent about the the challenges of neutrality and having to to sort of strip away any preconceptions or or beliefs that you have when you approach this as as a facilitator or a mediator. Um, can, could you describe what some of the challenges would be for members of this community trying to do trying to facilitate this on their own and the, some of the challenges they would face um, doing that? Well, I appreciate the question, Council Member. I'm, I'm reluctant to answer that because I, I don't in any way want to suggest that we as a team are, you know, uh, in any way better qualified than anyone else uh, to do this work. We simply have, you know, spent uh, a considerable number of years, you know, acquiring what we believe are the requisite, you know, skills and experience to, to do it. I, I will say that, you know, almost every commission of which I'm aware has um, utilized staff and, and executive leadership uh, that come from outside of the of the community of origin, um, and that's not because they necessarily couldn't find anyone local, or perhaps you know they tried and they and they couldn't. But I think it's because there is a benefit to someone who um, you know isn't coming in with a predilection to take the side of someone who is their next door neighbor or their teacher from school or their clergy, uh, any, any of the sort of natural human biases that we would all have towards people that we've grown up with or lived nearby or worked with. And I think in so many of these cases, commissions have recognized that there is a benefit to bring in someone or someones who, you know, ha have less of that, uh, sort of, you know, 
past and lived experience and um, can start from a, a different point of view. But again, Council Member, I, I just want to be very clear in saying that we in no way think that we have you know, more to offer than any local organization or that others couldn't do this work. We simply believe that we're capable of doing the work that's been asked of us. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Thank sure. you. I want to bring this back to council and if we can give our closing remarks on this item so that we can move forward. I think John, you was or you want me to go? I don't know because I haven't spoken yet. Sure, please. Okay. My turn. <laughs> uh, first, I, I really want to acknowledge that and acknowledge there is a division in buyback community. We don't have to ignore that. Uh, and I think, uh, as the mayor said and everyone said earlier, we really need healing. And I think the DRC committee, commissioner, this should be your, your job to do. First, before even you do anything, you have to, re to do the healing. Like start, like figure out a common ground, reach out. This is your core job, I think before even you think to bring a facilitator, or before even you think to start doing the work that, you know, Black Lives Matter issues that we create this TRC for it, before you go and work on those issues, you need to bring that healing. You need to engage with the community, the whole black community, by black community in general, and you need to find a common ground. That's the first thing, and after, you find that common ground. I don't know how it look and how you can do it, but you can figure it out. After that, you can think about bringing a facilitator or what the next step should be, because that's important. How are you gonna like, continue your work and there is division among black people in this community? We created TRC because of that. I think for us, Focus on this. This should be your first focus. And whether this is something you glance it down with the rest of the community, try to find a common ground, try to be one. That's what I, I don't know how, but you figure it out. The second thing, let's speak about the item on the agenda. First, I really don't want to, I'm not really by any means, like, try to not acknowledge that this facilitator had a lot of good experience, no doubt. Even though I always, as a second language speaker, English as a second language, I always thought the facilitator is somebody like facilitating in person and like coming, I don't know, maybe that's not true, but because I've been seeing uh, all the facilitators this before COVID at least, I see somebody who will be coming in and engaging and directing people. That's what I thought when we said we need a facilitator. But I just have a hard time imagining somebody will be from distant, can like really achieve the work that the TRC wanna do from this and given the fact that as a community organizer, who deal with a lot of people in the community from buyback community, whether they are immigrants or African American or Latino, I know that this is hard. They trust the community. And I think a local firm who can take this job to do, they know who to reach out to. They know that if they need to reach out to the, the Latinos, they can come to CWJ. If they want to reach out to also like certain people of the community, they know how where to go to. So this is will really shrink the learning curve, especially. Am I right? We have only like nine months for this ordinance to expire. It's not one full year. So we are asking those people to come and do this in nine months. And I don't know if that's helpful it can be happening or not. So let's go back to what Susan Mim said. Susan Mim, she liked process. And she said, 
This has been through a process of the city and everything I acknowledge. But she said something important. She wish if she can, we can do this differently and we can do it again and find a local people. I think so we can bring her wish come true. Because what I said. in the city, we many times we have done like a bet that people will, uh, like the city will put a bet and we get only one person and have a higher amount and we rebet it. We are not, that's also a process of the city, by the way. It's not something that is not done by the city. And they will bring it to us and ask us to rebut it again, and we will vote for it. And also Susan Mims and the rest vote for it. That means this is a common thing that we can do. We can open this. We don't have to go with the first one because the only one being us blind. We can rebut it, and we can put it again and see who's gonna come on board. And for TRC advertising, Jeff, I understand that you went through the normal process of the city, but not for a TRC. For TRC, it have to be have different approach of advertising this kind of job because, you know, it have to be like going through a lot. Like for example, neighborhood center. Uh, like we have, people have to know. Do you know that a lot of people they don't know there is something has been advertised that I know for this. There is a local firm that they don't know anything if this has been advertised because what we have been doing, we have advertising a lot of bit. You know, who know that the, how the bit been advertised on the website? It's a developer normally. And there is some few, another thing I understand, some other people know, but for, for TRC, we should have really different approach to advertise it. That's what I really think. Thank you. And so we can re-advertise it, and that's according to the process. So because I want to follow the process too. Uh, what else I want to say? I think that's it for now. Are you sure? I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna be voting no for this. Okay, anyone else? Are we ready for roll call? Well, no, I, oh, I'm just Okay, I wasn't sure I if you might be speaking. Super dull. <laughs> <laughs> right, no. Um, this is a very, very complicated situation I think we're in. Uh, um, you know, we're, we're being asked to approve a contract to conduct a truth and reconciliation process. That's a very, very unique, specific process. This is, this is something that, that I felt from the very beginning here was going to be a real challenge, was that in order to do a truth and reconciliation process properly, it most likely was going to require the expertise of a team, such as we received the application proposal from, in order to conduct it. Now, I had mentioned at our last meeting that, you know, I, and as I think has been stated by the team, that the, they, they are simply facilitating, mediating, and offering a framework in which this TRC process can be conducted. Um, which I still feel is, is something that does require a special expertise. The, the actual work, the actual picture that's painted by this process will come from the community. But how it's facilitated is a whole different skill set. Now what, so I, I think we, we've got, as you know, I think Susan has said, we've sort of gone through the process and we've ended up where if we were, um, you know, soliciting uh, proposals on a more kind of normal, what, what we might normally expect to, to have done under kind of the auspices of the city of Iowa City, um, we, we would be on, on firm ground. However, you know, this is a truth and reconciliation process. It's a very unique uh, thing to, to, to undertake. And so I, what I'm sensing is, you know, we, we went through the due process, 
but I'm not hearing, you know, we, we have all these very deeply committed members of our community saying they feel disenfranchised by this, this outcome. Uh, and I'm, you know, this is really the first I've heard that. I mean, I, we've been attending these meetings. This, this work has been underway for months. And I personally have not heard what I heard tonight from the broader community. You know, so I'm trying to process that. It, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a difficult situation to be in. Um, essentially where I've landed is I do feel we need to, to create a strong a foundation on which we can agree to move forward with the truth and reconciliation process. I'm not sensing we have that trust in the foundation. Um, so I'm, I'm reluctant to approve the proposal as written. Um, I could envision uh, we take this process step by step. Uh, we could perhaps consider uh, undertaking the first task, which if you've read the proposal is convening and understanding. I'm not sure I could go any further than that in terms of under, you know, getting a sense that we know where we're going with this process. I, I don't know that we have that foundation in order to get into any other level of detail than perhaps having that first meeting. If we agree to have that first meeting, um, but perhaps that first meeting would, would serve as a feasibility as to whether we can then move forward with the rest of the process. Um, the, so for now, I am, I'm, I'm not willing to approve the contract as written. I do feel, you know, I think we're in a regrettable situation in that there did seem to be a disconnect between the work of the TRC and the work of the larger community. Uh, and that's what I see as, as needing to be the first step. We, we need to bring together those who are feeling out of the process into the process so that we can get, have a better relationship between the, you know, the, the, the members of our community, but also a better understanding of what this process is going to entail. I, don't, I really don't know that there, there is a clear understanding of what that process will be and what the role of, of the facilitator will be um, so, so in my view, there needs to be that first conversation. I would be willing to, as I said, consider the consultant working on the initial tasks that this, the, this process outlaid. Um, but I'm not really, we're really willing to go much further than seeing if we can build that foundation. Uh, it may be that the truth and reconciliation process is not what this community wants. I don't know. Um, but I, I do feel at this point, I'm not willing to invest in the entire process until we have that level of foundation. Well, members of council, I think I have a, a yes and um, in response to, to John's comments, which is the contract itself, the contract itself, which we are considering this evening, says we can terminate the contract on seven days notice. And the consultant is paid for their work up to that point. It also says that they have to come to city council and present to us should we ask them to. There's no cap on that. There's no maximum of that. Those are unusual terms, I think, in something like this. And I think they foresaw that there could be a false start or a, a way in which the process wasn't successful. And we can pull the plug. But we have been at this for a year since September 2020 and we have tried the facilitator once and we're trying again we paused the commission we reconstituted the commission and as one of the decision makers sitting up here I do not trust us to try it a third time and I think this is our opportunity to say are we willing to go forward and and if it isn't working we can stop that's what the contract itself in front of us says. I, I would agree, um, and I think, thank you, Laura, for pointing those things out. I think that's really important. Given what I've heard tonight, I, I hear what you're saying, John, but I don't see how 
any of that trust and healing is going to develop in these divisions without an outside facilitator helping. Um, I think simply to tell the TRC, figure it out, you can do it. W what I'm hearing tonight is members of the TRC feel like they are punching bags and other members of the community don't feel that the TRC members are legitimate, so to speak. And maybe I'm not phrasing that very well. Yeah, that's not the right word, but yes. <laughs> they, but they don't have trust in the TRC or the TRC leadership or whatever. And so there, there's no, there doesn't seem to be that respect or trust between the various individuals here. And I, I don't see how simply to say figure it out isn't going to happen. And so um, to suggest that we don't move forward until that is done, I, I think we're done. I think we're done. And, and so, and, and I think I, what I would agree with, with Councillor Burgess point is if we can terminate this on seven days notice, we can ask them to come and report, then let's, they have the experience. They have done this in communities where there is significant division. They have figured out how to work through that. They have the neutrality, which I think is actually very important. Do I wish we'd had more responses to the RFP? Yes. Does that mean we have, would have selected a local one? I don't know. I hadn't really thought about the importance of, of maybe the benefit of having an outside, more neutral group to come in and do some of this background organizational kinds of stuff. It's the community that needs to do most of the work. But to have some of that structure put in place by an outside neutral third party, I hadn't really thought about how important that may be, especially when you do have divisions in the community, and we have those. So I'm in support of moving forward with this, and particularly, um, especially now with the comments that Councilor Burgess has made. To your boy and Council Burgess about there is a room for termination. You're right. There is a room for termination, and you ask us now to move forward. If we don't like it, we can terminate them, right? And we, or at least the mayor and I, black leader in this committee, we asking you to reopen the process, and those people can apply again too. Mm -hmm. That's what our request is. Yes, don't do it today. Let us open it again, and for people to come, maybe another group, local, will be applying, and also the same Karen and West can apply again, too. Like, we are asking you to re, let us just re, vote now for this and reopen it for, like, more people to come and apply, just like any process, and it's the same thing. You requested something, and we are requesting something, and I think we are not saying they cannot apply, but they can come and apply again and maybe local people can apply as well. Save money. Be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. I've been debating whether to say this, and with all due respect to uh, members of this, the outside firm, um, the previous TRC members were heard to say the reason the facilitator that we had all approved of and they had originally approved of was treated with disrespect. They were heard to have said that they didn't trust old, white, bald guys. And I'm sorry I'm saying that, but this is what I've heard from many people, including that person. And if that's true, that was the reason that facilitator fell through. And members of this firm are no, no disrespect, in, but they're older and white men primarily. What is the TRC going to uh, feel about them? How are they going to work with them when they've already been proven not to be able to do that? I wanted to go ahead and maybe call to the question so we can get a vote, please. What? I move to call the question. Thank you. Any, so I think we're ready for a vote. I, I would like to make one quick comment. That is that the votes are taken in the order called by the city attorney and that now that we are in the calling of the question, there are no more comments or discussion. Thank you. Roll call, please. Mims. Yes. Salih. No. Taylor. No. 
Teague. No. Thomas. No. Weiner. Yes. Burgess. Yes. Motion passes four to three. No. Don't Don't fail. Three to four. Uh, motion fails four to three. Three to four. All right. Number 13, and thanks to the public for coming out. I know this has been a hard challenge, and thanks to the counselors. We're at item number 13, which is announcements of vacancies previous. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. Climate Action Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through December 31st, 2022. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, September 28th, 2021. Airport Zone and Board of Adjustment, one vacancy to fill a five-year term January 1st through 2021 through December 31st. Board of Appeals licensed electrician, one vacancy to fill a five-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, Jefferson Street, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. And we are at item number 14, which is USG. We welcome you all at this time. That this is uh, tonight was our first meeting with a bunch of new senators, um, and so we just wanted to say to you all, um, like, kind of welcome them and everything. And moving forward, I'm excited to have some more like new voices at the table as well. Thank you. All right, uh, council, city council, updates or information. On Monday, uh, the 27th at 5.30 p.m. at the Voxman Music Building on Burlington Street, right across from the Oracles of Iowa City murals, will be a reception to celebrate that artwork and to um, have a conversation, I think, with the artists. That was a city-supported project, and I think probably everyone who's driven down Burlington Street has had an opportunity to see it, and I know we've received a fair amount of input. Um, so I encourage people, if they want to learn more about that art or understand uh, why it is, to go to the Voxman Music Building, 530 on Monday. I would like, <clears throat> I would like to um, thank the Iowa City Community School District for putting in place a, universe, a mask mandate. Uh, they, that is basic public health. The city has a mask mandate that is still in force for individuals. Uh, public health is public health. Masks are source control. Um, as I, and as I said when I spoke at the, uh, the Iowa City Community School District meeting where they put in place the mask mandate, the notion of freedom to not mask because masks are source control is essentially saying you have the freedom to infect. That is not public health. Public health is for the common good. I am proud of this council and for this mayor for putting in place a mask mandate. I'm proud of the community school district for, for doing it. Please, we have the capacity to bring this pandemic under control. Please get vaccinated. If you're vaccine hesitant, please talk to someone you trust who can help get you there and please wear your masks. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to just talk about a few things, uh, uh, past events that happened. Um, on 9-11, there was a celebration. It was called Summerfest that happened at the Johns County Fairgrounds. This was a time to really commemorate the 20 years uh, from 9-11 um, and to really uh, take time to pause and really think about that day uh, that really changed how we operate here in America. 
It also was an opportunity for our um, first responders to be celebrated and thanked for, especially this past year, of how they've really um, done some things that typically uh, they've not been asked to do during COVID. On the uh, September 12th, there was a 125th bash uh, celebration for the library. Um, that was a great event, well attended. It was great to see um, just the celebration of what the library does uh, for so many people here in our community. It's pretty important uh, that we have our library to be uh, continuing all the activities. Then it was a great day to be out there. On September 17th, actually it was a three-day conference, uh, September 15th through the 17th, the Iowa League of Cities met in Coralville. It was hosted by Coralville. And that's where cities all from around the state come together, um, both uh, elected officials and staff. And it was a, a, a wonderful conference. There was lots of opportunities to go into breakout sessions. Um, there was proposed legislation um, from the Iowa League of Cities. And I'll just, you know, just tell you what some of their um, what they were in, in category. It was local control, which is really home rule that we talk about. These are going to be some of their priorities that they're going to be putting forth. Financial stability, economic development, infrastructure, and public safety. And so these are the things that they're going to be, um, that we are going to be as a Iowa League of Cities taking forth in this next General Assembly um, for their consideration. And then Last night, I did attend, it was Save Corville Lake. Um, so there is a, a group called the Friends of, I think, of Corville Lake that has assembled really to talk about um, the lake itself. It was designed to be a 50 to 100 year type of a, a project, or that was the life expectancy. And so now what they're trying to ensure that elected officials and communities around know that there are concerns about the lake um, and it's going to take more than um, the Corps of Engineers really to pay attention to the changes that are happening. So just wanted to give those updates. Yeah. Any other updates? No. All right. We're going to go to reports from our city staff, our Jeff and our city manager. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Well, uh, most of you uh, have had a chance to meet Redmond Jones, our new deputy city manager, and we're really excited to have Redmond join the team. This is day two uh, for him, so still uh, still getting his feet on the ground here. Um, so welcome, Redmond, and uh, really look forward to working with you. I know the whole team does. Uh, for the last four months, our office has been down one. We're a three-person team in the uh, city manager's office, so the, the uh, I think... Theoretically, uh, two of us would have to pick up a lot of the slack, but I can tell you over the four, last four months, Rachel Kilberg, our assistant city manager, has picked up far more than her share of the, of the slack uh, with uh, this position being vacant. And not only has she picked up the, the routine matters, but you all know that she's led the ARPA process as well, which is a huge lift in and of itself. So I just want to thank Rachel for her, her continued outstanding work in the city manager's office. And then last but la uh, not least, we are uh, in the middle of Climate Fest. So I hope you've had a chance to check out the schedule of events with Climate Fest. This is really our opportunity to tell our story about our uh, progress towards our emission reductions goals and uh, more importantly, what we and others can do to continue us down uh, that path. So whether you're into music, film, art, uh, electric vehicles, and cars and bikes, there's literally there's something for everybody. Just encourage you to check out the schedule of events that's still going on this week. It's icgov.org slash climate fest. And just urge everybody to get involved in uh, something that aligns with their interest. Thank sure. you. I have a question for you, Jeff. Uh, first, congratulations to our WT City Manager. Welcome. And uh, I want to ask you, just for the public seek to know, is he is the first person of color to be in this, like, hired at the city manager office ever? Or somebody else was before him? Do you I, know that? I could not answer that. I'd have to, I'd have to do some homework on that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I just would love to know that okay. answer and for the public to know. And congratulations for the city for hiring sure. our first 
people, person of color to the city manager office. Yeah, I think city is doing, we're doing great of adding diversity to the city. Great, thank you so much. And we're gonna invite our deputy city manager, Redmond Jones, to invite you to have any comments if you should choose. Well, I just want to share my excitement for, for um, being able to work with each and every one of you. Um, it's actually kind of been on my bucket list to work for Iowa City. It's been in my uh, uh, purview for quite some time. I've had an opportunity to uh, serve the uh, Davenport community, and Iowa City was always uh, one of those, uh, keep an eye on that community as a, as a competitor, as, as you know, the. The world is getting smaller and, and uh, you, you have friendly competitors and uh, Iowa City has certainly been known to set the trend in many areas that uh, definitely caught our attention. So uh, being able to uh, have this on, on my resume is going to be super exciting and I'm looking forward to working with Jeff and the team and I believe we're going to be doing some really great things. Great. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. 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 All right, we're going to go over to our not so new anymore city attorney. <laughs> uh, still learning. Uh, I just want to join uh, Jeff in welcoming Redmond uh, aboard. It'll be great to have you and looking forward to working with you closely. All right, and our also not so new city clerk. <laughs> and always, since I'm always last, I'm going to say ditto to Jeff and Eric like I always do. So. <laughs> awesome, awesome. We're at item number 17. Could I get a motion to adjourn? Move. Second. Second. Moved by Celie, seconded by Mims. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We're adjourned. <laughs>